Alex Wilson was reborn in the Marvel world as a regular civilian, without any special power. He was living away from the bustling city where villains mostly lurked around. But his luck eventually ran out, like all those humans who die all the time thanks to those supervillains and heroes' fights. He got caught up in a fight between Hulk and Abomination when he went to the city to buy some supplies and meet his father, who was living in the city, resulting in a spinal cord injury. But thanks to the lunatic doctors who performed various tests on him, he found out he had a perfect immunity mutation. But excessive tests killed him in the end. Once again, he woke up in a new body, Peter Parker's body. Now, he has a second chance and power to tilt the balance of power. Follow this journey as he goes on a revenge rampage and tries his best to make the most out of Peter's intellect and luck with girls. He plans to become a selfish hero who will put his own happiness before others and live his life his own way. But do things always go as planned? MC kills villains without any mercy. What's up ladies and gentlemen? It's your boy, Omni Sensei. Welcome to What If I Was Reborn as Spider-Man? Path of Revenge. Part 1. Hit that thumbs up. Subscribe to the channel if you haven't subscribed. Also, remember to check out the original story, link in the description. Without further ado, let's get into it. The year 2016. Location. New York. Central Mall. Have you ever experienced death so close that it could make your heart stop in a split second, but never did? Instead, kept you alive, in pain, trapped under rubble in the burning remains of a 1970s Volkswagen camper? Have you ever found yourself at the mercy of another living thing, with all means of life termination within its reach? Have you ever wished death upon those around you in pure ignorance, while leaving you alive to watch your own despair? I know I did. After 20 years of my rebirth in this freaking dangerous Marvel world, I knew this would happen eventually. Damn it, I never should have come to the city. My vision was almost completely covered by thick soot and debris. I could only see what little I could peer through out of the only part of the driver's side windshield that was left. Glass cover my arms and all I could do was wait and suffer. Everything seems red. My right side, I can't remember exactly what happened. Everything was blurred. All I could remember was the sound of a loud, screeching metal followed by shards of glass piercing into me, blood trickling down my arm. I was in so much pain, but I couldn't scream. All I could do was breathe and hope and wait for the end. Not only that, but I could see something move. I tried to call out to it, but I couldn't get my throat to move the way it needed to. The rubble began to move. I could see Green Hulk smash his way through with ease until he reached me and ripped off what remained of the camper to expose me. His eyes glowed as bright as the burning fire around us. His face showed a face of pity. Hulk saved tiny human. My body was covered in burns and cuts. Green Hulk picked me up gently and held me in his hands, my entire body aching and in agonizing pain. My life was literally in the hands of the strongest Avenger, as I could barely keep my eyes open. But I could see a red giant, Abomination, trapped in an energy field suspended in the air. Some guys in black suits were putting him inside a giant truck. While Iron Man was rescuing the nearby civilians who were caught in the sudden rampage between Abomination and the Green Hulk. Tiny human safe, Hulk puts me on a stretcher near Captain America, and let the EMTs take care of me, before he leaped back into saving more people from the wreckage. I wanted to thank Hulk, but all I could do was let myself fall asleep to the sound of distant sirens. I woke up later that day with an oxygen mask on, wrapped in a cast, hooked up to an four. A woman in her mid-thirties, blonde hair, and dark iris, checked up on my vitals and looked surprised when she saw me awake. The hell? I, I can't feel my body. Welcome back. Your burns and cuts have been treated, but I am sorry to inform you that your right side is paralyzed due to spinal cord injury. But due to your condition, you can no longer drive or perform the same functions as before. Do you have any family, friends, or contacts that we can call? She asked. 
I felt nothing, nothing at all. The feeling of utter horror when being told about this is traumatizing. Stay calm. Stay calm. I need to somehow contact my family. I'm sure they can somehow fix me up. Dad works at one of the Stark Industries. He holds a somewhat high position. I'm sure he can pull some strings and give me top-notch treatment. John Wilson. My dad. I somehow managed to spit out, coughing to the side. She pulled out a notepad and pencil. Okay. How can they be contacted? 29 Jackson Drive, King's Cross, New York. All right, stay calm. I will contact him. She gave me a pitiful smile and walked away, looking at her PDA, leaving me alone. God damn it. Why the hell do I have to pay the price of their fight? Just why did a stupid battle like this have to go down and wreck an entire section of a shopping center? Damn it. Paralysis. What the hell do I do now? What if there is no cure? What if I will have to live the rest of my life like this? I clenched my fist in anger. Six months later. It's been six months since that incident. Luckily, my dad was able to get me into a facility that specializes in experimental neurosurgery thanks to Tony Stark. Every day, I was put through countless scans and tests, the surgeons trying to locate the exact point of the injury. All these fancy high-tech medical devices didn't make me feel any better though. The pain I felt was agonizing, sometimes my right leg twitched. Last day, I overheard someone saying something about experimental drugs to stimulate damaged nerves. I don't know what drugs they were talking about, but I can tell that they are working. I have more control over my right side, but not enough to walk or stand. I still have to rely on a wheelchair, though. As days passed, the tests have slowly become more intensive. Sometimes I wasn't allowed to eat for three days straight, so they could observe how I would react. I'm not too happy about this, but whatever helps me get better, I guess. Sometimes I would wake up God knows when, because doctors were messing around my head. Some messed up dream I had once. I could hear things while my eyes were closed. I opened them and no one was in the room, except for me and the machines monitoring my brain and body. These mother schmuckers have turned me into their guinea pig. Experimental drugs, scans, tests, injections. They better help me fix myself. Or I don't even know what I can do in my condition. I haven't seen dad for weeks. Weeks? Maybe more. I don't know. I have lost track of time ever since I was admitted here. Subject Zero X has exhibited extreme resistance to multiple dosages of drug, our 7-0X1. Administering the next dosage, some lady with glasses and a white lab coat injected me with a strange colored syringe. Now they're calling me Subject Zero X? What the hell? I thought all they wanted was to fix my spine? Doctor, Subject Zero X is beginning to enter stage 3. It appears to have a negative impact on the subject's brain. I can see two nurses come into my room and hold my shoulders down, restraining me. Increase the subject's dosage. The company is pushing us to complete project. X before the deadline. The doctor lady replied before I could see one nurse push a button, sending more of the drug into my system. I have no freaking idea what's going on. I can only hear their voices and think. Other than that, nothing. Subject 0X shows zero response after entering stage 5. Administering the stimulator. This time, a bald guy in a suit injects me with a syringe that glows yellow. Subject's neural pathways are being healed and regenerated. It appears to have been successful. I can feel the feeling on my right side coming back. Holy Stark! I could move my finger. I tried to move my foot, but it wasn't fully functional. But they pushed some kind of drugs once again, making me numb. Congratulations, Dr. Jones. You have exceeded the deadline. Project. X has now entered the final stage. Some older man with glasses walks in. This bastard is the one in charge? What do you mean by the final stage? Let me go, you mother schmuckers. What is Project? X, sir. A woman's voice. I have heard her voice once before. Ah, that day at the hospital. Project. X is him. The older man pointed his finger at me. Have you ever heard of a perfect human? Document Hazel. Perfect human. What does Subject Zero X have to do with it? Subject Zero X has exceeded every record we set for him. It has shown zero signs of deterioration to drug, our 7-0X1. Immune to all types of infections, viruses, bacteria. Just think of any type of diseases you can imagine. And he will resist them, Dr. Jones replied, walking toward me before pressing his finger against my cheek. Our 7-0X1 is a combination of Earth's most deadly diseases. 
Yet Subject Zero X lives. His regeneration capabilities are even thousand, no, a million times greater than that of Logan. Yet there are no signs of X genes in his body. What the hell? Perfect human? Me? Wait, these lunatics, damn it. A regular human with mutant-like capabilities, yet has no signs of mutation. Subject Zero X has exceeded humanity. I can see Dr. Jones inject me with yet another drug. Freaking hell? Is he trying to test how resistant I can be? Then why didn't his body heal after that incident? Hazel asked. We believe his body has a certain limitation. Perhaps it depends on his will? We are not 100% sure about that just yet. He has the ability to manipulate his own cells and nerves to heal himself, Jones explained. But he doesn't know about it himself. But with the right amount of stimulation from these drugs, his body can do the rest. So, what's the final stage? Hazel asked. Damn it, this biatch. Just why is she so curious about this bullshit? Can't you see that these mother schmuckers are going to use me for some sort of evil experiments? The final stage is to test whether he can survive the world's most deadly toxin known to mankind, Jones replied. What? What does he mean by surviving the world's deadliest toxin? Poison? Chemical? No. Dr. Jones, the world's most deadly toxin. What dash? Hazel wanted to ask something, but Jones cut her off. It's classified. You are dismissed, Dr. Jones said before turning to the nurse beside him. Transfer subject 0x to laboratory Z. The nurse nodded her head and pushed my stretcher out of the room along with Jones and Hazel. They strapped me to an operation table, connecting tubes and needles to me. Don't worry, kid. This is all for the betterment of the humanity. A cure to incurable diseases, cure to every illness. We can even save those suffering from radiation damage. You are the future. Jones gave me a smile before leaving. I want to vomit after hearing that. Schmucker must have got his head messed up thanks to these chemicals. Yeah, you freaking lunatic. You better hope I don't get out of this alive or I will make sure that I will send you but straight to hell. Then I will kill that mother schmucking bitch. No, killing them will be too easy. Yeah, I'll skin them alive and then drown them in a pool of nuclear waste. One of the nurses turned on a computer monitor before leaving the room. My consciousness faded in and out as my vision began to blur. God damn, these mother schmuckers. This, I hate all of them. Especially those bastards who caused this in the first place. Abomination, Hulk, and that iron bastard. Damn it, Huff. I jumped up on my bed in a cold sweat. A bad dream? What was that? What did that Jones schmuck inject me with? I looked around my room. It's a small room with a huge window. I can see snow falling outside. Winter. Morning light. I wonder what day is it today? No more importantly, I got down from the old bed. I feel like a new person. My head felt clear. My eyes were sharper than before. And I felt powerful. No, that's not the correct word to describe how I felt. I felt strong, full of life. I quickly checked my right side. Everything felt fine. I bent my knee, stretched out my hand, touched my face, wiggled my fingers. Perfect. Everything, everything is functioning. I even got abs. What the hell was that nightmare, though? I walked over to the mirror, just beside the door. Eeh, who the hell is that goofy-looking nerdy guy? What in the freaking hell is going on here? My facial structure, eyes, face, all of it had changed drastically. I have no damn clue who that guy was. The person in front of me was someone else. I looked around the room. I need to find something about this guy and think about what's going on with me. It's not my first rebirth, but I need to find out about my present situation fast. The walls around me were covered with the pictures of the Avengers. Captain America, Iron Man, Hulk, and the others. There were even small figurines of Iron Man on the desk near the bed. I can tell that I am still in the Marvel world, but I need to find out which timeline I have dropped myself into this time. Huh? A school bag next to the door. I took a peek inside. There were some books and copies, a couple of pens and pencils, and an ID card that read Peter Parker. Age. 18. Midtown High School. Holy Stark. Peter Parker's Spider-Man. I quickly checked my wrist. H.A. I should have known. I am yet to be bitten by that spider which means I don't have superpowers. But I do have his face and body. Now what do I do? I need to find out more about this version of Peter and this world. More importantly, 
I need to follow the cannon event and get bitten by that spider. Finally, after two freaking rebirths, I'm going to get some power. Then, I will find those bastards responsible for my death, and I will kill them the exact way they killed me, drowning in toxin. I clench my fists, remembering the tortures they have put me through. Next, I went through the drawers and found some clothes, and wore them. Damn it, I need to buy some new clothes for myself. Wearing someone else's clothes? What a crappy situation. I searched the room for any other clues about my past. I found a notebook with notes scribbled on it, nothing too important, and a few pictures of Aunt May and Uncle Ben. I miss you, Uncle Ben. A note was written on one of the photos. So Ben is dead in this timeline. If so, then is Aunt May going to die during the canon event? I wonder. Peter. The voice of a woman called out from outside the room. Maybe downstairs. Breakfast ready. Coming. I yelled back as I made my way toward the bathroom. Wait. How the hell did I know which way the bathroom is? Memories merged into my head as I walked toward the bathroom. I remembered that I had lived with Uncle Ben and Aunt May for a couple of years since my parents died in a car accident. This house was my second home. I looked at my reflection in the mirror. Uncle Ben died in a car accident six years ago. I sighed as I stripped down and stepped under the shower. The memories kept coming back. I remember being bullied at school because I was a nerd and not interested in sports or girls. I was also timid. Aunt May was always there to comfort me. There is another one, a girl with blonde hair, Gwen Stacy. She was my crush and we were good friends, but this nerd never gathered enough courage to ask her out for a coffee. What a coward. A damn pushover. Getting his but handed over by Flash and saved by a girl. Shameful. I mumbled as I closed the shower tap and stepped out. I dried my body and put on my clothes as I went downstairs. As for our financial situation, well, it isn't that good. We have a small apartment, and I am working at a newsstand, delivering newspapers, and working part-time at a pizza joint to help May with some financial support. She often refuses to take money from me, but I insist on helping her as much as I can. I more or less get the gist of the mess this Peter was in. As for how he died, well, I have no idea. Yesterday was just the usual day for him. He followed his daily, boring routine. Woke up, bath. Ate, delivered newspapers, school, got bullied by Flash as usual, saved by Gwen as usual, had a small talk with her, worked at the pizza joint after school, went back home, did some homework, and fell asleep. Well, that's it. I need to improve our financial situation so that May can take it easy. Huh? Too many things to do. Let's take this chance to do something different. Good morning, May. I said as I entered the kitchen. Morning, Peter. Breakfast is ready. She smiled as she put a plate of toast and eggs in front of me. Finally, some human food after God knows how long. Don't cry. Hold it in. Just eat or she will think you as some weirdo. Wait, that's Aunt May? She is freaking hot. I couldn't help but stare at her for a second. Her red hair was tied neatly in a bun, and she wore a simple white dress, which showed off her curves. Damn, she is a MILF. Those boobs and curves. Damn. This is the freaking MCU version of Timeline. Peter, Peter. She waved her hand in front of my face. Huh? Why, M.A.? I stuttered as I came back to my senses. She chuckled as she put her coffee cup down on the table. Something on my face? In no, May. Everything is fine. It's just... I paused, trying to think of an excuse. I had a weird dream last night. What dream? She asked as she sipped her coffee. It's nothing, May. Don't worry about it, I said as I started eating. You sure everything is alright, Peter? She asked, concerned. You have been acting strange since the morning. H.A., it's the dream. I sighed with an awkward smile as my eyes fell on the calendar. It's July 4th, 2014. That incident happened around 2016, and then those bastards trapped me and turned me into their test subject. I have no idea how long I was in their captivity since I lost track of time. Anyway, 2014, two years in the past. Huh? Damn it. I don't want to remember those painful days anymore. At least for now. And speaking of which, if I remember correctly, around three days from now, I bought a lottery in my past life. My number was 18382900 And the winner's number was 18382900 I lost by one digit. But what a coincidence, right? 
reincarnated at the perfect moment like some plot armor. Now hope that it's still the same. This time, I will make sure to buy that lottery ticket. Huh? Weird. How the heck did I recall some freaking lottery number from years ago? Photographic memory? Or some kind of memory restoration? Whatever it is, it's handy. Was it bad? She asked as she finished her coffee. It's the opposite. It was a good dream. I want a huge amount of money in a lottery. She laughed. A lottery? Goodness, Peter. You need to focus more on your studies. I nodded as I finished my breakfast and stood up. Don't worry. It's just a dream and not to worry. I won't waste money on lotteries. Good boy. She smiled as she stood up. It's already 740. You better not be late for school. Yes, May. I said as I quickly finished my breakfast. Then I went to my room, grabbed my bag and wallet, and made my way toward the front door. Bye, May. I said as I closed the front door behind me. Bye, Peter. Have a great day. If memory serves right, then the school bus won't be available for the next four days because the fatty got arrested for smoking pots in the school bus yesterday. I walked to the bus stop. It kind of feels weird. I am walking again like a normal person. How much have I dreamed of walking again after that freaking incident? I smiled as I boarded the bus. I took the window seat at the back. The bus moved and I looked out the window, watching the buildings and people going about their business. Speaking of the past, I don't recognize those brand ads and a few new buildings. Something looks weird. As for the rest, it's all the same. Um, is it really the past or the future? If it's past, then the past me should be still alive or maybe this is an alternate reality? Could be, yeah. Need to spend some more time before jumping to conclusions. Maybe I will swing by my past house. Dad stopped visiting me back then. Although I was angry, I had these bad feelings. I hope he is doing all right. What are you looking at? A familiar voice brought me back to reality. Huh. I looked up and saw the brunette taking a seat beside me. Her name is Michelle Jones Watson. She is smart, but kind of pokes fun at everyone. A sarcastic person, if you ask me. Besides, Peter has hardly paid any attention to her. And as far as I can recall, she hardly has any friends and she is hard to approach. I said, what are you looking at? She repeated as she stared at me. I wasn't looking at anything in particular, I said as I turned toward the window again. Huh. Peter Parker, the weird nerd who stares at nothing in particular. You should be careful. One day you might end up staring at something and get into trouble. I will keep that in mind, I chuckled. So, what's up? Nothing much. Just waiting for the bus to stop at the next stop so I can get off. She took out a small book from her pocket and started reading. Bunking school? I asked as I looked at her. She looked at me. You're talking too much today. And you are as gloomy as ever. I grinned. She smirked. Whatever, nerd. Why do you care? Are you interested in me or something? Let me tell you beforehand. I'm not interested in a nerdy guy. So, don't go through all that trouble. Oh. I just smiled as I looked out the window again. What? Say it, she said, closing her book. Say what? You were about to say something. What is it? She asked, irritated. You're wrong. I shrugged. About what? You are showing too much interest in me for someone who just said, she isn't interested in a nerdy guy. What? She narrowed her eyes as she stared at me. I. You. You are. Ugh. She sighed as she turned away. I am what? I asked, grinning. A pain in the butt. So, shut up, she said annoyed. Fine. I won't say anything anymore. I put my hands up, surrendering. Good. You better not. I have had enough of your talk for the day. She said as she opened her book again and continued reading. I just smiled as I looked out the window again. After a few minutes, Michelle stood up. You are acting weird today, Parker. The bus stopped at the next stop as she walked out. Um, bunking school, huh? Could be fun. I thought as I followed behind her after paying the ticket. Where are you going? Michelle asked, annoyed. Who knows? Maybe you can tell me where you're going and I will tag along. Ugh, you are really testing my patience, Parker. She sighed. Just go away. I don't want you to follow me like a creep. And here I thought I would invite you to a cup of coffee or something. I shrugged. Are you asking me on a date out of nowhere? She asked, surprised. No, not necessarily. Just two classmates hanging out. You know, having fun and chatting. Nothing else. What? You got anything better to do? I can go my own way if you don't want to hang out. Michelle stared at me for a while before saying, Fine, whatever. I want a chocolate donut with sprinkles and a latte. 
Wow, that's specific. I grinned as we headed toward a cafe nearby. One must be specific when it comes to food and life. She replied bluntly as we walked by the street vendors selling flowers. True that? So, how come you bunk school today? It's not like you. Sometimes I get bored of studying in those stuffy rooms, so I like to go for a walk, she said as she kicked a can on the road. But what about you? You sound a lot different today. You want to know the truth? I asked as we reached the cafe. She nodded. Yes. Spit it out, Parker. She turned toward me near the door. Well, I was reborn in the morning like you see in one of those novels or movies. A new me, like a rebirth. Michelle blinked her eyes as she stared at me with disbelief. Ha, huh, ha, huh. very funny. So, you decided to be weird today, huh? She turned around and opened the door. I just grinned as I followed her inside and ordered the donut and latte she wanted. I ordered a small sandwich. I'm not that hungry since I just had breakfast a few minutes ago. We sat by the window and started munching on our food. So, why did you follow me? She asked as she sipped her latte. H.A., hey, you are not going to let it go, huh? I sighed. To tell you the truth, I guess I am just tired, tired of everything. So, I just wanted to go somewhere different and hang out with someone different. And you chose me? She asked, raising an eyebrow. Should I be honored? Why not? You're different from the others in our class. I mean, in a good way, that is. You are direct, and you don't hesitate to speak what's in your mind. I find that pretty cool and refreshing. Ah, uh -huh. are you sure you didn't hit your head or something? You were talking a lot. Where did our shy Peter go? She asked as she nibbled her donut. Well, that Peter doesn't exist anymore. Maybe I'm trying to show my true self. I grinned as I unwrapped my sandwich. And that is, that I can talk a lot. And I am not as shy as you think I am, I smirked. And I know you were just like me. Ha! Huh. How can you say that? Just because I am being nice, you think that means I am hiding something? She chuckled sipping on her latte. Well, I think everyone has something that they hide. And you are no different, MJ. I took a bite of my sandwich and started chewing. You hide behind your sarcasm and bluntness. Puffed. And what's wrong with that? It's better than pretending to be nice and kind, she smirked. And that's what makes you, you, different from everyone else, I said as I finished my sandwich. Coming from the weird nerd, she shrugged. Hey, now that's being mean, don't call me a nerd. I had to study hard since I wanted to get a college scholarship. I pretended to be sad. And it hurts, you know. All right. She looked at me and smirked. Not nerd then. How about weirdo? Huh? She's good. Man, I'm having a hard time coming back with a reply. This is a change. But I gotta try though, right? No more shy Parker. He is dead. It's time for me to step in and up the game a bit. We talked for a while, and MJ would always come back with weird replies. Sometimes I couldn't even say if she was serious or joking, and it was kind of funny and annoying at the same time. But, she's a nice person. So, any plan for what to do next? MJ asked as I paid the bills. Oh, my wallet. I need to earn some cash ASAP. I thought you had a plan? I asked as we stepped out the door. Yeah, right. She rolled her eyes as she tied her long brown hair into a bun. Wait, don't tell me you planned to just go on a walk, hoping something interesting would pop up. I stopped in my tracks, stunned. This girl is so lazy. She glanced back with a smirk and started to walk as I followed her. What was that again you said? I asked, smiling. Something about specific or something like that. Care to jog my memories? People who live in the past are stupid like you. People who look forward are smart, like me and Jay smirked. Oh, this girl is good. Anyway, you don't mind if I join you in this planless adventure, right? I asked, catching up with her. This is a free country, and you are a free person. Do what you want, Parker, she shrugged. We just wandered around the city, going through the shops and markets, and walking around the Central Park. As we got near Times Square, the energy of the city was electrifying. It feels like years since I have visited this place. Man, this brings back old memories. Some good, and some bad. But still, I wonder how much time they spent painting themselves. If it were me, I would just put paint in the bathtub and dip into it. Time saved. And as the saying goes, time is money. MJ said as we came across a man posing as a statue near the side lane. Now, that's some great advice, I chuckled. As we were nearing the Rockefeller Plaza, I noticed a couple arguing. It was weird. She just started accusing him of cheating 
and throwing his stuff on the ground. The man looked puzzled and couldn't say anything. People around just ignored them and walked by. That's life, MJ said as we passed them. That girl is the cheater. I saw her smooching an old guy last week near that alleyway. Whoa, are you sure? I don't wear glasses like you, Parker. So yeah, I am sure, she crossed her arms. Damn, so much for her and her boyfriend. I shook my head. Life's not fair, huh? Wanna butt in? Could be fun. You know, like in the movies. MJ looked at me for a while before grabbing my arm and dragging me to the couple. Hey, excuse me? I noticed your arguments and I think it's better if I intervene, she said with her thick sarcasm. Now, I will be blunt. She has a sugar daddy. She turned toward the baffled boy who was on the verge of tears. Take your stuff and don't waste your life on someone who doesn't love you, blah, blah, blah. Got it? Great. Bye. Before the boyfriend could reply or process what she just said, she had already pulled me to another alley and started laughing hysterically. Now watch the boy. She peeked out and then leaned against the brick wall. What? I asked, confused. Watch the boy, she repeated as I followed. You bitch. Give my Pixel phone back. Oh, and don't forget that Mac I bought last month. Also, the two diamond rings. I heard the boyfriend shout as the girl yelled back. It's too late now. I knew you were the one cheating, but a damn sugar daddy. You damn gold digger. MJ started to laugh as the couple fought and then finally parted ways. This is life. Never judge a book by its cover. She smiled as she straightened her green hoodie. That was something else. It was fun, but also awkward and hilarious. I shook my head. But still, sugar daddy? She shrugged. Like I said, never judge a book by its cover. Huh? She glanced toward my face, narrowing her brows. Right? I guess I have judged a book by its cover. Huh? People who live in the past are stupid like you. People who look forward are smart, like me. I threw her words back at her as I started walking. I will kick you, smart pants, MJ said as she walked with me. As long as you don't cheat on me or start smooching an older gentleman, I'm good, I smirked. Dream on, Peter. Dream on. The sun shed a warm glow over the park as MJ and I sat on an old wooden bench, the scattered talk of passing giving a melodic backdrop. MJ took out a lunchbox containing an array of sandwiches. Don't tell me she would have eaten that many sandwiches alone had I not tagged along with her. Well, feast your eyes, Parker. Lunch is served, she announced dramatically, handing me a sandwich wrapped in foil. I unwrapped it and bit into the soft bread, savoring the flavors. It tasted amazing. Did she make these? Damn. Did you make these sandwiches yourself? I asked impressed. Who knows? Maybe I did, maybe I didn't. Eat up, Parker. Life waits for no one. She smirked as she bit into hers. Thanks. I smiled as I ate mine. For what? She asked, confused. It's just sandwiches. Hump, huh, this tastes good. These are amazing. You're a sandwich maestro. She smirked. Well, I'm a woman of many talents. Sandwich making just happens to be one of them. She quickly realized she just said that she made them tisk whatever. I chuckled, it's okay. Your secret is safe with me. I won't tell anyone you make delicious sandwiches. We spoke and laughed as we ate our unplanned picnic. MJ's witty remarks sprinkled our chat, making every topic more interesting. Remember that time when Flash Thompson tried to show off in class, but ended up embarrassing himself? I chuckled as I remembered the encounter. Oh, the glorious moment. His face turned redder than a tomato. Classic Flash. MJ chuckled, taking a bite of her sandwich. But it was even better to see him bully you. Oh, I am missing the old Peter. Shy and always making a fool of himself. Ouch. You just had a hurt where it hurts the most. I sighed, shaking my head. But I guess you're right. Old Peter was a loser. She raised an eyebrow. You seem to be okay with it, huh? Why is that? Any plans to turn back time and be the old pushover again? I smiled and shook my head. No, I'm good. I like myself as I am now. No more shy Peter. Just a cool guy. Interesting. Who would have thought Parker would become confident and talkative? Then maybe I will have to watch out for this new Peter, she smirked, sipping her water. I just grinned and shook my head, sipping my water. I don't have to worry about being the shy, nerdy Peter anymore. 
The first thing I have to do is change my pushover image while keeping myself away from trouble. It's not going to be easy, but I'll make it work. For Peter. For my future. Look at us, goofing around and acting like fools. This is not so bad, huh? MJ asked as we watched the world go by around us. I don't remember the last time I talked this much and spent this much time with a classmate. Well, at least you never gave me that weird look like everyone even though I made fun of you a couple of times. What weird look? I asked, not understanding. That look people give you when they don't want to waste their time on you. Like you're a waste of space. That's what I call it. The you are the crap under my shoe look, she sighed. Anyway, today was a nice change of pace, Parker. Agreed. I said, watching some birds land near our spot. So, what's the plan now, Mr. Rebirth? We still have a few hours to waste, she asked, leaning back on the bench. Let's go toward the lakeside. Sounds like a plan, she said, pulling out a small notebook from her bag and scribbling something down. What are you writing? Something unrelated to you. Anyway, let's go, she said, getting up and walking away. I followed her, and as we walked, we just randomly talked about random things. We came across a couple of street performers, engaging in hilarious conversations with strangers and getting annoyed by obnoxious tourists. It was like a roller coaster ride and I was enjoying every moment. Isn't this a bit too much? I chuckled as we ended up in front of a mime artist doing exaggerated movements. MJ grinned mischievously. Oh, come on. It's all part of the experience. Plus, this mime's expressions are priceless. We observed the performance for a while before continuing our aimless exploration. Eventually, we found ourselves near a small pond teeming with ducks. How about a duck race? MJ suggested, pointing at the quacking creatures. And what now? I raised an eyebrow. We each pick a duck, give them fun names, and let them race to the other end of the pond. Winner buys ice cream. She beamed, already crouching down to inspect the ducks. I couldn't stop laughing at her ridiculous idea. Okay, let's do it. I never thought I would be spending time with a girl the same day I woke up after my death. And to top that, a duck race of all things. It's hilarious, and I can't help but laugh at how absurd it is. I mean, what would a sane person do after waking up in another person's body after dying? Not a duck race, that's for sure. Well, maybe I'm not the sanest person in the world. But it feels good to have someone to talk to and laugh with. I wanted to talk to someone so badly after lying in that cold lab for God knows how many years. How much have I yearned for someone to see me and talk to me? Maybe I was missing a human touch more than I realized. What's with the sad face? MJ asked, looking over at me from her spot. I snapped out of my thoughts. Oh, nothing. Just thinking about. No, forget it. Maybe I will tell you later. We chose our ducks. Gave them crazy names like Quack Attack and Speedy Feathers and released them into the water with a lighthearted countdown. Our feathered competitors paddled poorly, generating a funny race among our applause and laughing. You owe me an ice cream, Parker. She yelled as Quack Attack edged slightly ahead. Let's not count our ducks before they hatch. I replied a wide grin on my face. The race ended in a tie since both ducks crossed the finish line at the same time. We smiled, admitting that there was no clear winner in our race. All right, tiebreaker at the ice cream shop, she said as she led the way out of the park. I couldn't help but think that the day's activities with MJ were a breath of fresh air in this new existence as we made our way towards the local ice cream shop. She has softened a little and is acting like a child full of energy. This isn't a bad start, in my opinion. She is now smiling more often. Um, as we snuggled into a cozy seat at the ice cream shop, the sun dropped low in the sky spreading a golden tint across the cityscape. The chime of the bell above the entrance greeted us, and MJ scanned the flavors with exaggerated curiosity. So, Mr. Rebirth, what's your pick? She smirked, her gaze fixed on the menu, as if it contained the keys to the cosmos. Decisions, decisions, I murmured as I pretended to examine the flavors carefully. I'll go with the classic chocolate chip mitt. MJ rolled her eyes amusingly. Boring option, Parker. But suit yourselves. She ordered, sweet strawberry cheesecake delight, please. You know, Parker, I've got to admit, you're not as insufferable as I initially thought, she added as she dug her spoon into her ice cream. Wow, what a compliment coming from you. I chuckled, enjoying the ice cream. I'll take it as a sign of progress in our budding friendship. 
Let's not get carried away now, Parker. I wouldn't want you to start thinking you're tolerable, she teased, a mischievous glint in her eyes. I chuckled, enjoying the comfortable friendship we'd formed throughout the day. MJ seemed to be letting down her guard a little more with each passing minute, exposing a side that wasn't always concealed beneath her cynicism. I realized how much I was enjoying her company as we finished our ice cream. The day had been an unexpected experience, and being with MJ made it even better. She had a sharp tongue, but underlying that was a genuine person, someone I would like to spend more time with. Hey, Parker, don't let it get to your head, but today wasn't entirely terrible, she interrupted my thoughts. I'll take that as a glowing praise, I answered, smiling. Thanks for not making today entirely insufferable for me. Don't mention it, she said a tiny smile on her lips. With the evening settling in, I realized it was time to head to Stan's Pizza Joint for my part-time job. Well, I guess, this is it for today, I said as I checked my watch. You got somewhere else to be? She asked, surprised. Yeah, I have a part-time job at a pizza joint, I explained. She smirked, interesting. Who knew Peter Parker had a job on the side? Well, don't let me hold you up. I'll see you around, Parker. I nodded. See you at school tomorrow. She walked away, leaving me with a warm feeling in my heart. I watched her from a distance as she took the bus and disappeared into the sunset. Well, Peter, time to deliver some pizza. Damn it. I need to find a way to earn some quick cash fast. I mumbled to myself as I walked toward the pizza joint. If the lottery fails, I will pursue some higher goals that this Peter always wanted but never tried to pursue, but the problem is money, and I don't even know if I'm going to get bitten by that spider. If I get my power, it would be a piece of cake to earn some money. AJ. Anyway, time to get to work. Working at Stan's Pizza Joint wasn't exactly Peter's dream job, but it paid the bills and helped Aunt May with her finances. The familiar aroma of freshly made pizza met me as I went through the door, blending with the bustling talk of customers and the sizzle of cheese in the oven. Stan, the owner of the place, greeted me with a nod from behind the counter, signaling that it was time to get started. Hey Pete, we got a busy night ahead of us. Stan said, his mustache twitching with a cheerful smile. I nodded, slipping into my work apron and preparing for another evening of tossing dough and dishing slices to hungry customers. Amid the city's craziness, the repetitive routine seemed somehow soothing. Okay, was that Stan Lee? In person? Like, the man himself? And he owns this pizza joint? Wow, I can't believe it. That's incredible. It's like one of those cameos you see in movies, but for real. I wonder if he really owns this place or pops in occasionally to say hello. I guess I'll have to keep an eye out and try to spot him next time I'm there. But then again, I could be wrong and he might turn out to be a regular human of this reality. Anyway, time to focus on the job. The nighttime rush started with orders coming in quicker than I could fold them. I went quickly between the kitchen and the counter, sometimes peeking at the clock. I couldn't help but think of MJ. Her witty chatter rang in my head. Despite the bustle of the establishment, memories of the day's adventures lingered, painting a smile on my face as I greeted each customer. Little did I know, the night was about to take an unexpected turn. Hey Pete, Sam and the others are busy with their delivery runs, and we got some more delivery orders. Leave the kitchen to Josh and go take care of it. Stan pointed to the pile of pizzas waiting to be picked up. I nodded, glancing at the first address scribbled on the receipt. Michelle Watson, what the f MJ? Oh, it's probably just a coincidence. I took the boxes, put them in the bag, then strapped it on the back of one of the delivery cycles and headed out. I didn't know her address. Well, I will find out today. As I cycled down the streets, my phone rang. It's from May. I put the headphones in one ear and answered, still pedaling hard. Hey, May. Peter, you busy? She asked. Yeah, on my way to drop off some deliveries. Everything okay? I asked as I took a left turn. It's a shortcut that this Peter used to take to save some time. I guess his memories have somewhat perfectly merged with mine, sometimes making things weird like muscle memories. Yeah, nothing's wrong. Can you buy some milk on the way home later? She asked. Sure, anything else? I said, weaving through traffic. Oh, nothing, just milk. And be careful on the road. Yeah, I will. Bye. Peter, love you. She said, then hung up. I pedaled on eager to get to MJ's apartment and check if it was actually her. However, before I could reach the location, 
I was interrupted by an explosion nearby. It was close to her address, just two blocks away. People ran out, screaming and pushing each other as the sound of gunfire rang through the air. Damn, something is going on near MJ's apartment. Whatever it is, I am sure the Avengers will take care of it. Besides, I don't have my power yet. Let me quickly deliver the order. I drove on, with sirens ringing through the air and a rising sense of urgency gripping my gut. As I parked the bike outside her building, an ambulance pulled up, sirens flashing. And from what I could hear from the nearby crowds, it turns out to be some drug cartel deal gone wrong, and they are fighting among themselves. Ring! I pressed the doorbell, wondering if it was the right one. Coming! I heard a shout, followed by footsteps approaching the door. It's a girl with long, curly, brunette hair, who opened the door. Here comes Mr. Rebirth. What a coincidence, huh? Ah, just as I thought it was MJ. Coincidence indeed. I took out the pizza box from the bag and handed it to her. A little birdie told me a Michelle Watson placed an order for a medium pizza with extra pepperoni. She chuckled, took the box from my hand, and showed me the online payment code. I entered it into our shop system and nodded, confirming the transaction was complete. Parker, you better stay here for a while. You must have heard the shooting, right? It's not safe, she looked worried. It's the first time I've seen her making that expression. I frowned, feeling a growing concern in my gut. But I don't have a choice. Well, I am already late with other deliveries. Don't want Stan to get mad. Okay, be careful. See you at school, she smiled. Sure, see ya, I got onto the bike, strapping the pizza boxes securely to the back, and pedaled away. As I sped toward the next address, I kept my senses alert, listening for anything that may warn me of danger ahead. Soon, I was on the opposite side of town, surrounded by the chaos of the city streets at night. But a nagging worry still lingered in my gut, prompting me to rush the deliveries even quicker. Alright, this is the last one. Hum, well... Who would have thought my dad from past life ordered two pizzas? I was eventually going to pay a visit after getting my spidey power, but I guess today I'm going to have a rough idea about how that old man of mine doing after selling his son to some mad doctors. Wait, late night pizza. I remember that night when my cousin Jenna came for a visit and we were watching a horror movie at night and dad ordered pizza that night. I don't remember the exact date, but it might have been around this month. I'll get a rough idea of the situation soon enough. This is going to be an interesting one. I parked the bike in front of a familiar house. The memories of this place were hazy, but they lingered enough to recognize it. The quaint, old-fashioned design of the home remained unchanged. The once beautiful garden is in complete ruins. Old dead plants, a broken water fountain, and the swing set left to rust. No, this isn't right. Why the hell is this place in this crappy condition? Don't tell me. Taking a deep breath... I approached the door, boxes in hand. I hesitated before pressing the doorbell. The sound echoed through the quiet street. Seconds felt like minutes as I waited for someone to answer. Finally, the door creaked open, revealing a man with graying hair and lines etched deep into his face. You look like you could use some sleep, sir, I said as I extended the boxes. Yeah, right. Sleep. Damn it. What the hell am I supposed to say? That I am your reincarnated son, whom you left for death? I am glad I didn't just blank out. Besides, he looks like a sleep-deprived ghost. Those bags under his eyes. He chuckled, taking the delivery and nodding at me. Yes, it's been a rough couple of months. He paid me the order. I handed him the receipt. Hope. Everything turns out well, sir. Take care. I walked back to the bike, leaving him standing on the porch with a sad expression on his face. Damn it. Alternate timeline. What about me? Did the events happen early? Or is it something else entirely? No, 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 this won't do. I need to know what happened to me in this timeline. Am I alive or dead? I must know. If it's the same group that killed me in the other timeline, then I will at least have a chance to take revenge. Too many questions and zero answers. And this broken dad of mine might be able to shed some light on it. Now that I know he is alive, I will visit him soon enough. Then I will get my answers out of him. Take some rest, Dad, soon. Your worst nightmare is going to visit you. I wonder what kind of face you will make after knowing the truth. No matter which version you are, someone has to pay. I got on my cycle, already feeling the darkness closing in around me. I drove down the street, but this time I didn't speed. 
My mind was already lost in thought. I wanted to yell at him, ask him why he left me for death, but I couldn't do it. No, I didn't do it. It wasn't the right time. Yeah, it wasn't the right time. Past or future or a mixture of reality, it doesn't matter. I will find them. Night. After dinner. After dinner. I lay on my bed, going through my memories. And now that I am recalling them, they aren't that fun. But it is what it is, no point living in the past anymore. Since I am in Peter's body, I will make the most out of it. For starters, kick flashes, but bastard bullied this body too much, but this body is too weak for a fight. So I will have to wait for the genetic lab tour coming up in three days when a spider will bite me and give me that awesome spotty power. Then I will kick his butt. So might say, you got superpower and you're going to beat up a school bully? Why the hell not? I bet no one going to miss that bastard. Besides, I am not Peter Parker. I'm not a righteous person like him. I won't sacrifice my happiness just so I can play a hero. Peter Parker can sacrifice himself over and over. He can play a hero. But me? Not a freaking chance. This time, I will make sure I won't become a pawn for other stupid plans. Apart from that there is some weird crap going on. I mean the girls. There is Michelle, Gwen, Mary Jane, Liz Allen, and the list goes on. Everyone is in the same school as this guy. It's as if all the realities have merged to create a mixed world. But, Liz Allen, huh? As far as I can recall, Peter has a crush on her, but she is Flash's girlfriend and thinks Peter is a loser. She even ridicules him daily alongside the others. What a bitch. She won't see me coming for her, no. As a two-time reincarnate from original Earth, I know more or less everything about her and the others. I know how she will blow her relationship with Flash due to her crush on Spider-Man in the future, and then she slowly falls for Peter, but at that point, he loses interest in her and starts dating Betty Brandt. Man, this is going to be interesting. So many girls love Peter Parker. Huh? Now that I think of it, dang, this lucky bastard. I still remember that comic scene where he and Carol planned a date, but the guy was so broke that Carol took him out on a date instead and paid for everything. Talk about being a loser. What's the point of sacrificing everything and living up to others' expectations when you can't enjoy a good and happy life? Well, time to get some facts straight. First, get spider power. Second, take revenge on the bullies. Third, steal Liz from Flash. Fourth, master my power and become a selfish hero who will prioritize his own happiness. First, fifth, create different custom web shooters and gadgets. Sixth, Confront that father of mine and dig up info on the group responsible for my death. 7th. Kill those mothersmucker responsible for my death. 8th. Get rich. 9th. Get girls. 10th. A happy life with a big harem and maybe join Avengers and go. After Carol and Susan. Yeah, I will adjust them as I go, but that's the plan for now. A big harem ending. No more hopeless and broke guy who is barely hanging on to life with just scraps. I will not let my aunt or my girls go through any hardships or disappointments. Well, in the end, it's money, huh? It always was the thing behind every single problem on original Earth. No matter where and when I was, the reality always boils down to it. One can say, when everyone's money is equal, there will be no problem, or people's desires are infinite. Thus, no matter how much a person gets, it's never going to be enough for them. But if you think that's true... Then why do you go work on a daily basis? Why is a billionaire working with their startup? People are greedy, and this greed never goes away. If it is ever satisfied, then one will become satisfied and will settle down, never trying new things and ending up in a monotonous cycle. But hey, as long as you and your family are happy, it doesn't matter, right? But I can't wait to see Aunt May's face after I win that lottery. That's enough thinking for now. I need to get a hold of my thoughts. With memories of my past and Peter's memories merged in, my mind feels like a messy junkyard. Sometimes I feel like I can't tell the difference between my old and present lives. I think it will take some time before I get used to it. I look around me to find a way to divert my attention. Ah, a puzzle cube. I started playing with the puzzle cube and quickly finished it. Then I began solving it repeatedly and started doing it faster. I guess it's one of the skills that Peter has subconsciously gotten while messing around with this cube and is slowly improving on it. As time passes by, my movements became smoother and the speed was increasing slowly as well. I enjoyed this feeling while playing with the puzzle cube. 
Morning. The chirping of birds woke me up. I stretched my body. The puzzle was lying beside me. I must have fallen asleep while solving it. Oh crap, am I late? What's today's schedule? I look at the calendar on the study desk beside my bed. Then, shit, I gotta go and deliver newspapers. I quickly put my clothes on, freshen up a bit, and then I rush down the stairs. Don't rush, Peter. You still have 15 minutes left. Aunt May said as she walked to me and gave me two sandwiches. Ride slowly and eat them along the way. Okay, see you later, I'm going, I said as I kissed Aunt May on her soft cheeks and went towards the little backyard. There it is, my old cycle that has seen the passage of many decades. I took it out and began to pedal slowly while eating. This sucks, man. But then a realization washed over me and I stopped in my tracks. Crap, that was close. Why the hell am I going to deliver newspapers in a freaking morning? I'm not Peter Parker, right? God, it was like an automatic reflex. Anyway, I can't let this job go either way until I win that lottery. This is an alternate reality, so I am not that confident that I will win it. Crap, the freezing breeze bit into my skin, cutting through all the clothes I had on. It was still 5.30 in the morning, and the darkness seemed to stretch on forever with just a handful of streetlights still on and flickering. I resisted the urge to shut my eyes as I pedaled my bike, feeling the exhaustion from lack of sleep tugging at my awareness. Just a few more days, Peter. I shivered as I folded the newspapers, which felt like slabs of ice in my hands. My fingers were numb from the cold, making it difficult to hold the handlebars. These cheap gloves ain't working. A yawn escaped my mouth. Sheesh. I am done after I get this month's paycheck. Each house felt like a challenging obstacle course. The occasional slip on the icy walkways made it even more difficult, forcing me to stay alert even when I was exhausted. My eyes were heavy, almost closing with every blink, as tiredness weighed me down. Each time I had to deliver papers, it felt like forever. All I wanted was to crawl back into my cozy bed. Right now, even in this painful experience, I feel alive. I trudged on, battling the freezing cold against fatigue. Even in my second life, I am complaining. Huh? Responsibilities, huh? Don't run away from them. Finish the job you have taken on and have been trusted with. Don't leave anything half done. Hardship is a part of life. The more you endure, the stronger your heart and mind becomes. Uncle Ben's words echoed in my ears. I quickly shook it off. The only relief was a warm breath that fogged up the icy air, telling me that I was still awake, still battling through the frosty dawn. I longed for the time when the last piece of paper would slip from my grasp and I could finally return to the comforts of home. Maybe I will get a nice hug from May after I return home. After four hours, I finished all the papers and I got back home with aching legs. Thank God, I am done with this part-time crap. You look beat up, Peter. May commented as she passed by me, heading toward the kitchen. How's the weather today? Snow again? Yes, snow, and a bit windy too. I replied as I removed my socks and threw them into the laundry basket. And I forgot my gloves today. My hands are freezing. Oh, Peter. She shook her head. That's why I told you not to rush. My bad. I chuckled as I followed her towards the kitchen. May placed the cup of hot chocolate and some buttered bread slices in front of me and said, it should help you warm up, thanks. I said as I took the cup in my hands and held it, letting the heat radiate against my skin and slowly spreading warmth throughout my hands. Then, I sipped the warm liquid, letting its rich sweetness pervade my tongue and provide some solace for the chill. I breathed in the delicious aroma of the chocolate drink as a wave of warmth passed throughout my body, starting from the mouth. H-A-A, this feels like heaven. I don't even remember the last time I had some chocolate. As I gulped down the last drops of the soothing hot chocolate, I check out the watch on the wall. Time to take a bath and head out for school? So, how are things at school? She asked as she began cleaning up the kitchen. Same old, I said, just homework and stuff. Have you got some sleep last night? You seem pretty busy these past few days, she asked in a concerned tone. Yeah, the exam is coming up in a few months, so, I said as I finished off the last slice of bread. Better do a head start than cram it all in a single week, she smiled at me and nodded her head. But don't forget to take a breather now and then, all right? We'll do, I said, standing up from the chair. 
time to take a nice bath, relax a bit, and head off. I took a relaxing bath and came out of the bathroom feeling like a brand new person. The tension has melted from my shoulders and the weariness of yesterday's and today's work. I stepped into my room and was about to get ready when I heard a loud voice. Someone's fighting in the neighbor's house. I took a peek out the window and recognized the familiar face. Yeah, Mary Jane is living just on the opposite side of our apartment, and she is arguing with her father. Great. The day couldn't have started any better. I thought as I heard Mary Jane's father shouting, Get the hell out! Before slamming the door closed, she sat near the worn-out gate and stared emptily ahead. Her knees joined together as he put her forehead on it. Dang! She's in such a pitiful state. Her fiery red hair is tied into a loose ponytail, and she is wearing her school uniform. I want to kick the drunk schmuckers, but right now, but I am not so confident in this weak body of mine. I might get beaten up instead. And who knows if that drunk got a shotgun. Should I go talk to her? Well, what could go wrong? I took off the towel and opened the closet. Let's see what I've got. I grabbed a simple pair of jeans, t-shirt, and a pair of socks. Ah, a new pair of underwear. Thank God. Peter just bought it a few days ago. Luckily, I don't have to wear his old underwear. Anyway, there I was happy to find new underwear deciding which one to wear, the blue or red one. The door opened and May entered the room. Peter, where's your clothes? I'm doing laundry. Huh. She saw me standing in front of the closet, buck undressed with two pieces of underwear in my hand. Her eyes grew wide and she stood rooted to the spot. Her cheeks flushed beet red and I could see the clothes fall from her hand. Oh, May, Erm, um, you see. Uh -huh. I babbled incoherently while still holding both pieces of underwear, covering my meat grinder. Crap, this is bad. May was looking at me as if I had grown another head. I forgot to lock the door. Damn my life. Oh, oh. Sorry, Peter. I should have knocked. She shook her head vigorously and quickly closed the door behind her with an awkward smile plastered on her face. I will be in there, you know. Bring your clothes after. Ahem. She cleared her throat. Crap. Schmuck. She saw me undressed. Oh. My freaking God. What do I do now? May saw me naked in my flaxed meat grinder. What is this embarrassing feeling? My heart is beating so fast. I'm so damn nervous right now. Damn it. Face it like a man. Peter. I put on the underwear, picked up the clothes she had dropped, and took a deep breath before opening the door. Let's do it. I took the dirty clothes and headed for the washing machine in the little laundry room next to the bathroom. May was inside. Wow. She is on her fours trying to do something with the washing machine. Her hot but is sticking out, showing its curvature through the morning gown she wore. I couldn't help but stare at her rear for a few seconds before approaching her. She is a real beauty. Too bad she is my aunt. Wait a minute. She is Peter's aunt, and I am just another soul inhabiting Peter's body. Then that means she is not technically my aunt. I can make a move on her. I clear my throat. Ah, everything all right. I want to grab her waist and drill her from behind. Damn, this is a very enticing sight. Wait, isn't this scene kind of... Peter, can you lend me a hand here? This blasted washing machine is not turning on, she said as she turned her head around. Our eyes met for a split second before she suddenly turned her head around again. She's blushing all of a sudden. Yeah, let me see. I knelt beside her and took a peek inside the washing machine. Although half my vision was on her cleavage slightly sticking out from her gown. Looks fine to me. I said as I tried pressing the on button. Nothing happened. Maybe the plug is not inserted properly. I suggested as I pushed the plug, which was a bit loose, inside the socket. Still nothing. Damn. What is wrong with this thing? I thought it was supposed to be working. I groaned as I pulled out the plug. I thought so too. May sighed. Let me check the fuse. Maybe something blew out. I said as I stood up. Just wait a minute. The box is in the backyard. I opened the backyard door and stepped onto the porch. Snow was everywhere. Schmuck, this is going to be troublesome. I was lucky it didn't snow when I was delivering pizza. I would have frozen my butt off. I walked slowly, making sure that I wouldn't slip. Peter, be careful. May warned. Will do. I waved my hand absentmindedly. I walked toward the fuse box located just a few feet away. I wiped off the snow covering the top and opened the box. Wow, 
This looks pretty messy. Wires were sticking out from everywhere. Which one is which? Ah, a loose wire. That could be it. I turned the current off for a moment, then pulled out the loose wire and plugged it back inside. Let's try now. I switched the current on and waited for a few minutes. Ash, that rumbling sound of the old washing machine. It's on. It's working. I shouted as I closed the box and began heading back. Thank you, Peter. She smiled gratefully as I entered the house. No problem. I smiled back at her and was about to go back to my room when she called me. Peter, she said, about just a moment ago. Oh, crap. Oh, uh, yeah, about that. It was an accident, I said. I don't want her to be creeped out by me. Yeah, I know. She chuckled awkwardly. But Peter, she said in a serious tone, you were growing up and... She took a deep breath as if hesitating for a moment. Then she said, if there is anything you want to talk about, then don't hesitate to do so. Talk about what? Girls? Shabowinking? She continued, I know it's hard to speak your mind since you know I am your aunt, and... Yeah, that is kind of difficult, but since I am not related to you in any way, May, we could always be more than just aunts and a nephew. So, she said in an awkward tone, if there is anything you want some guidance about shabowinking or relationships. She looked down, refusing to meet my eyes. Wait, did she just suggest that I could ask her if I had some problem regarding shabowinking? I, I am sorry. I'm going to sound like a weirdo. Never mind, she scratched the back of her head and headed towards the kitchen. I'm going to finish the remaining chores. No, don't worry. It's obvious to you to show concern. After all, I'm already 18, and I am sure you don't want me to do something wrong in the future and get into trouble. And since you are the only family I have, so of course you want to look out for me. I flashed her a winning smile. She smiled and nodded her head. Yes, exactly, Peter. And if you ever need me, then please don't hesitate to ask anything. I will try to answer the best I can. Oh, what a lovely woman she is. I might just take up that offer. I smiled as I returned to my room. I closed the door and sat on the chair with a wide grin on my face. So, Peter, do you have some problem in that area? Outside, time to go to school. I left the house, closed the door behind me, and jumped down the stairs. I noticed Mary Jane sitting in the same spot where I had seen her this morning. I walked over to her. She was lost in her own thoughts, so she didn't notice my approach. I noticed she was shivering because of the cold weather. She isn't wearing her jacket. Must have forgotten when she stomped out of the house in anger. Man, I feel kind of bad for her. She had to deal with that drunk of a father all alone. I approached her quietly. You know it's cold out here? I asked softly. She was startled. Her body trembled as she raised her head and saw me standing before her. P. Peter, she stammered. Yeah, I smiled at her as I handed out one of the jackets I took before coming outside, just in case. You might want this. She stared at the jacket in my hand. Then she looked back at me with a confused expression on her face. It's all right, I said as I placed the jacket on her shoulder. Let's go. I extended my hand to help her up. Thank you. She nodded gratefully as she took my hand and stood up. She put on the jacket and took a step forward, and I could hear her sigh heavily. Another argument? I asked as we both walked toward the bus stop. She nodded her head slowly. My father is such a pain, she spat with disdain. He was drunk again, right? Yup, she shrugged her shoulders, drinking like a hog, throwing bottles at me, and forget it. Just another typical morning. Damn, that crap sucks. By the way, what's up with you? You sound different today. She asked as she examined my face. Shit, am I acting too weird? How so? I don't know. But it's weird, she said as she shook her head. You usually think three or four times before speaking. Sometimes you look lost trying to strike up a conversation with me. But now, you seem quite different. I'm, I'm just having a good day. That's all. She stopped abruptly, making me stop as well. Are you sick or something? She asked as she leaned forward and examined my face again. Do you have a fever or what? What? I stammered. No, not at all. Oh, come on, Peter. She frowned as she looked into my eyes. You know I can tell when you are lying. Well, I guess I decided to take a step forward and try to be more open. Does it sound weird? Do I look weird? Not really. She shrugged her shoulders as we started walking again. You do seem kind of weird, but not that bad. A good weird. Good to know, MJ. Anyway, thanks for the jacket, Pete. She smiled brightly as she rubbed her arms.
No problem. Bus stop. We waited for the bus at the bus stop. There were quite a few students at the stop, mostly from the neighborhood. Flash Thompson was also there, waiting for the bus. Man, I hate that bastard. Oh, look who it is. Flash and his three friends walked over to me. Great. Parker. Flash placed his arm around my shoulder and tried to mess up with my hair. He's always doing this crap. Look guys, it's one inch Parker. The others laughed as they surrounded us. Mary Jane frowned at Flash as he harassed me. She looked ready to rip his head off. But it's alright. I'm not Peter, but Alex, you mother schmucker. Although I can't win against him in strength, I still have my intellect. At least I have one. I smirked confidently. He stared at me wide-eyed. Huh? You know? I shrugged his arm off and patted his back mockingly. At least I have a sausage. His goons snickered at his expense. You poor soul still bullying others in high school? I crossed my arms as I taunted him. Seriously? Flash narrowed his eyes at me. Are you picking up a fight with me, Parker? That's the only thing you are good for. Fight and bully me. You must be jealous of me topping class, making a way for my bright future. While you... I patted his back again and smiled smugly. It must be frustrating to live without your main part, right? You can't even concentrate on your studies and repeat the same class twice. Thrice, I guess. By the way, do you feel anything when you see something good on the net? You know, I heard there are certain surgeries for these types of problems. Maybe you should try. I was slowly walking toward the lamppost as he continued to take steps forward, boiling in rage. Man, his face is red like a tomato. The nearby people were giggling and gossiping among themselves. And this is where he will break and throw a straight punch as usual. Bastard! Flash screamed as he threw a punch toward my face. And as expected, he threw a straight punch like a dumb schmuck. I calmly tilted my head to the side, and his fist barely grazed my face, hitting the metal post behind me. The crowd winced in pain as he howled loudly in agony. He fell on his knees and cried. His so-called friends only stood there, holding their laughter. I patted his head mockingly. See, this is the reason you have been in a repeating class for two years now. The bus is here. Pete. MJ walked over and patted my back. We should go. Well, I bent down and whispered in Flash's ears. How long are you going to act like a dumb schmuck? Grow up. Oh, and don't forget about the surgery. Humanity has come a long way. Take advantage of it. I winked at him as Mary Jane dragged me to the bus. The crowd broke into a loud laughter as we entered the bus. MJ was holding her laugh as we took a seat near the window. What was that? She asked. Are you insane? You can't mess with Flash like that. What if his friends knock you out? Well, I shrugged my shoulders. I'm done being a pushover. Besides, all bullies have one weakness, which is... Being exposed in front of people, I smirked confidently. Anyway, I might finally have a few days of peace. He won't show his face for at least a week, I guess. MJ agreed. That was amazing though, she added. It was the first time I've seen you standing up to that dumb bully. The rest of the ride to the school was peaceful. Mary Jane seemed lost in her thoughts again. So, I took out my phone and browsed through the news. It's weird that they didn't talk about last night's gunshot incident. Are they probably trying to suppress the matter? Maybe someone big is involved in that crappy mess. After a 10-minute ride, we reached our school. Midtown High School, the classes were kind of boring. I didn't find any interest in studying, but I had to pass this school. That's the only downside to my plan. The exam is near. Might as well take them instead of letting them go to waste. Anyway, most of my time was spent with MJ, Gwen, and Harry. I don't see Michelle anywhere though. She must have bunked again or there could be some other things going on with her. Anyway, time went by quickly. After school, I left the campus and walked over to the bus stop. Hey Peter, Harry called me as he ran over. Want to hang out together? I was planning on hitting the arcade. Want to join? Sorry man, can't go. You still doing the job at the stands pizza? Yeah, I sighed. I really don't want to work there, but... It might snow today and I am on delivery duty today. Need to finish my quota before the snow falls. Plus, I gotta take the groceries home. Oh, I see. He scratched his head awkwardly. Anyway, have you noticed something different about MJ? She looks sad or something. Yeah, her father got drunk 
and cause a lot of trouble in the morning. I think she is having a bad day because of that. I replied casually. I, I see. I guess we will hang out another time then. He nodded as he bid his goodbye. See ya, yeah. I waved at him as a private sedan pulled over in front of him. Harry entered the car and it drove away. And I took the bus to Stan's Pizza Joint. I have to buy that ticket today. After work, I went straight to the place where I bought the lottery ticket in my past life. It was a bit far away and it was snowing, but to get rich, I had to endure this cold crap. It was around 8.40 at night when I reached the place. The weather was freezing cold and the place was almost empty except for those regular gambling addicts. I approached the counter. Welcome, kid. The salesman greeted me lazily. A new guy, huh? Haven't seen you before. Anyway, are you going for the big one? Yeah. Someone said it's my lucky month. I replied casually. I will pick the ticket myself. Okay. He shrugged and nodded. Knock yourself out. He took out three stacks of grand winner tickets. The first prize is $30 million. The second is $15 million. And the last one is $7.5 million. And I remember all the three winning numbers. The cost of each ticket is $60. And it's going to burn a hole in my pocket. All the money saved by this body will be spent but it will be worth it. I searched through all of them, but found only the second and third winning tickets. Dang, someone got the first prize ticket before me. Oh, uh, well, I know a couple of more numbers for some small wins. Damn it, I'm going to spend it all in the lottery, like some addict. I wanted to, but only one to check if it's the same with this alternate reality, but, Ark, just hope the winning numbers are the same as my world. I will know it at the end of this week. I bought four tickets two for money and the other two for a nice latest PC and a washing machine. May will like the washing machine. Just thinking about the washing machine makes me remember the morning incident. After paying the man, I drove back to Stan's Pizza to drop the cash and the company's phone before going home. I usually take the bus, but today the bus is late due to the snow. So, Stan told me to take the cycle. The roads are empty and are already covered in snow. Damn it, I hope it stops soon. 17 minutes and 55 seconds of constant pedaling through the snowstorm. The trip home from my job usually takes 22 minutes if I don't stop at any red signals. Damn, the snowfall is making it so damn difficult. I feel like my balls are freezing down there. The air feels so dry and cold. I mean, seriously, how cold is it anyway? HAA, it's December. Christmas is coming. If I somehow win the lottery then I will be able to provide May with the best Christmas she could ever have. She works her, but off as far as I could remember for this body. And now that I am in control of this body, I want to do something nice for her. 12 minutes? The road is getting slippery. It's darn dangerous to cycle on such frozen, wet snowy roads. Just a few minutes left. I guess I will walk the cycle instead of riding. It's too slippery to cycle and will waste a lot of my energy. Finally reach the house. Crap. I will definitely catch a cold tomorrow. Damn. The snow was so freaking heavy. The roads will be closed in the morning, I guess. The light is on, and I can hear the sound of the TV. May should be waiting inside for me. I press the doorbell after parking the cycle in the backyard, and a few seconds later, May opened the door. She was wearing a black tank top and blue shorts, and she's not wearing any bra. It's quite visible. Oh man, she looks so hot in those. Her boobs are like huge watermelons. Oh, thank God. You are safe. She sighed in relief as she pulled me inside. I heard on the news that a truck skidded in the middle of the road. A few people died. You shouldn't have cycled through this storm. You idiot. I will give Stan a word tomorrow. His stupid ideas will put you in danger. Sorry. I apologized to her and sat down on the chair in the living room, still panting. It was freezing cold out there. Damn. She was genuinely concerned about me. Don't blame Stan. I took a little deeter on the way. The road was too slippery, so I too the long, safe way. She looked at me and frowned. You should have called me. It's dangerous out there in this cold. Young man, you better stop working on these part-time jobs. I don't want to get any more worried about you. It's only the two of us. And I don't want to lose you. SS. Sorry. I felt so bad. But the cycle was the only mode of transportation. And my detour to buy the tickets took more time than usual. Nothing's going to happen to me, May. I promise. She looked at me seriously for a few seconds and said, Promise? Really? Yeah. 
I will be careful and will call you next time I am running late. I reassured her. I promise. That's better, she nodded with a smile. Go clean up. I made some meat stew for dinner. Don't take long. It's getting cold. Right? Thanks. I smiled at her and kissed her cheek before going inside my room. My nose was so cold that it almost felt like it would fall off. But May's warm and slightly pink cheeks after kissing her were nice. Wow. That's cold, huh? Don't do that. She chuckled while touching her cheek, and she smiled before going back to the kitchen. Hell yeah, I did it. I feel like I am one of the MCs from adult games. Dinner table, May placed a large bowl of meat stew and some pasta on the dining table and said, Try it. I tried a new recipe today. Alright. I smiled at her. It looks nice. Yeah, I used the recipe I saw on KTube. It's a new one. The comment says it will taste real nice. She informed me and poured a glass of soda for herself. Try it before it gets cold. Sure. I took the spoon and brought a mix of beef stew, corns, and other ingredients to my mouth. Oh crap. It's delicious. This tastes fantastic. The new recipe you found is amazing. Really? Nice. She smiled at me. Then let's eat it before it gets cold. Both of us dug in and May switched on the TV and watched the news channel. And now we have a list of road closures because of heavy snowfall. The news reporter Mary and informed about road closures, 10th, 21st, and 118th streets. The roads will be dash. I turned my head and looked at May. I guess no school tomorrow. Roads will be closed. Yes, school is canceled. May replied and continued eating while staring at the TV screen. Roads will be closed. You will be able to get some good sleep without worrying about your jobs. Yeah, guess so. I nodded and resumed eating. Hell, it's so darn good. And I will get to sleep without going for another newspaper delivery. What about you? Don't tell me you are going to work again in this situation. I asked her with concern in my voice, and May shook her head. She works as an office lady for a small private company. May works really hard, and today's road closures would surely benefit her. The office is closed tomorrow, so... I am gunning for some extra sleep, she replied and gulped a spoon full of stew. After talking for a few more minutes, I decided to hit the bed. Tomorrow, I will go for a nice warm shower and spend time with May. She seems happy after being able to take a break, and I am happy about her. I am also glad to spend some time with her, without any school or work. The alarm went off. My head hurts, and my body feels a bit sore. I peeked down under the blanket. It's nine in the morning. Crap. This feels like a hangover. Maybe it's due to overwork. And the house feels colder today. I don't want to get out of the warm blankets, but damn, it's freezing. I need to switch on the heater. Okay, schmuck it. I switched on the heater and the lights. And just before I turned back, May stood at the entrance of her room in her nightgown. Wow. Her hair was all disheveled and her eyes were barely open. She looks so hot with that nightgown and the bulge of her chest can clearly be seen under the cloth. Good morning. I greeted her with a smile. May nodded and yawned. Keep the laundry in the basket. I will do them tomorrow. She pointed at the basket and walked away while scratching her butt. Damn, I like how her nightgown slides through her butt cheeks. It looks so damn good. I wonder if she is wearing anything under the nightgown. I slumped back on the bed and lay there for a few more minutes. Then I got up and did some light stretching before going for a light shower. Dang, it's freezing cold. Crap, I am still sleepy. I can hardly stay awake. This feeling is killing me. Damn it, I turned the shower hot and the hot water poured over my body like a stream. Hiya, I breathed a sigh of relief. Oh, the hot water slowly woke up my stiff muscles. My hands slowly traveled over my body, feeling my skin the curves, and every inch of my torso. Damn, it's been a long time since I got such a relaxing hot shower. I haven't felt this good for a while now. Maybe it's the yesterday's exhaustion. After a nice shower, I threw some warm clothes and a jacket on and went to the kitchen to brew some coffee. The house is quiet. May must have gone back to bed, I guess. It's so damn quiet here. No cars or noise from the neighbors. Just me and my coffee. But the silence and calmness are so relaxing that I feel like I can stay like this forever. After drinking my coffee, I decided to make a nice breakfast for May. She always works hard. Maybe today I will make her something for a change. I took out some bacon, eggs, bread, and cheese from the fridge 
and started preparing breakfast. It's been a while since I cooked anything, but I remember how to do it. It's like once you learn to do something, you never forget it. A bit rusty, yeah, but I can do it. The bacon is frying and the eggs are cooking in a pan. The smell is just heavenly and my stomach is rumbling like crazy. The kitchen is filled with the sounds of food sizzling and crackling. I looked out the window as the snow was falling heavily and it looked beautiful. When everything was done, I put the plates on a tray and I made sure that it was neatly placed and everything looked presentable. I made my way toward her room. As I was about to enter her room, I heard muffled moans coming from inside. Schmuck, yes, lick it. She moaned, God, get that tongue in, yeah, keep licking. The door was slightly open. She must have forgotten to lock it when she came to my room earlier. I peeked inside, unable to hide my curiosity. Hell, who am I kidding? I wanted to see her doing it. She was there, undressed and laying on her bed, one hand twisting her hard chest berries and the other one between her legs. The covers were pulled back, exposing her heavenly body. She had her legs wide open, her eyes closed, and her fingers hard at work. She was breathing hard, and her face was twisted with pleasure. Damn, she's so damn hot and wet. Oh, uh, oh, crap. You're too rough, baby. She groaned. Ah, don't stop. Shaboink me, lick me. Ah, yes, like that, baby. I wonder who is this guy. She's imagining while playing with herself. She sounds like she is really enjoying this. She must really love the attention and rough shabbo inking from this mystery man. God, I wish it was me shabbo inking her tight little coochie and making her squirm in ecstasy. But this unknown guy, I'm gonna schmucking kill him. Suddenly, she started climaxing. Her whole body shook as she rode herself to high heavens. The bed shook violently, and she let out a loud scream of pleasure, but quickly covered her mouth with one hand while roughly rubbing herself. Come with me, Peter. Ah, hey. Peter? Me? Is she fantasizing about me? Her nephew? Schmuck, my meat grinder was so freaking macho from watching her, and her words made it more macho. Crap, I never knew my Aunt May was a MILF 304. Should I just go in and shaboink her right now? Nah, not yet. Can't be too hasty and spoil things. May fell back on the bed and curled up. She looked totally worn out. Her face was flushed with pink, and her breathing was still shallow. She had sprayed her bed sheet with her sweet nectar. Damn, this was such a hot scene. It made my blood boil and my body sweat. H.A., what are you thinking, May? She mumbled to herself. That's just not like you. Playing with yourself? Shabbawinking fantasies? Ah, oh, God, it felt so good. And, but this is so wrong. She started shaking her head and whispering. He's your nephew. You shouldn't even be thinking about him in that way. No matter how damn hot and cute he is, you're not supposed to have dirty thoughts about your own nephew. You're just a sick and depraved hoe. But, damn, he got a big package down there. She was obviously talking about my meat grinder. She turned around. God, that Giat is so damn freaking perfect, so curvy and bouncy. I had to fight the urge to run my hands through them. Damn. May has the perfect body, her round, melons bouncing and jiggling, her chest berries rock hard, and her coochie leaking her sweet nectar. Gosh, that thick rear of hers is just begging to be pounded. Oh, wait, I got an idea. I somehow managed to hide my bulge thanks to this big old jacket and knocked on the door with the breakfast tray. I can't wait to see her reaction. Huh? Oh, uh, May, I brought you some breakfast. Huh? Pet? Peter? Just give me a moment, she replied. I can hear some ruffling sound. She must be trying to hide her undraped body in the wet bed sheet under that blanket. Her hot voice was filled with a sense of panic and fear. Damn, she sounds so damn hot when she's all nervous. Okay, come on in. I opened the door and entered the room. And yup, she is under her blanket and pretending to keep a calm face. Her hair is messy and her lips are wet. Schmuck, she looks so damn hot after playing with herself. I put the tray on the bedside table. Is everything okay? I heard some noise earlier. Noise? Ah, uh -uh. nothing happened. I'm fine, she stammered. Thank you for making breakfast, Peter. You didn't have to. No worries. I interrupted. Anything for you, M.A. Enjoy your meal. I smiled. 
You always work so hard for me. This is the least I can do for you. Her face blushed with embarrassment. Thank you, Peter. You're such a sweet boy. She stared at me for a moment. Hey, anything for you. I need to clean the dishes now. Enjoy your breakfast. I grinned and was about to leave the room. I stopped at the door and turned back. Oh, by the way, is it just me or are you looking beautiful today? Her blush deepened. Ha, huh, Peter, stop teasing me. I raised my hands in the air, just telling the truth. Thank you. I will take it as a compliment. She smiled back. Damn, I wish I could bury my face in her melons and lick her juicy coochie right now. But I gotta hold back for now. I left the room and closed the door behind me. I need to whack off soon, or I will go insane. These teenage hormones are driving me crazy. Afternoon, the snowfall has stopped. And here I am cleaning the snow from our front yard. Damn, it's so freaking cold. I've almost cleaned it all. Just hoping it won't snow hard again. I noticed MJ is also shoveling snow from her yard across from us. Hey, I walked over to her. How are you doing? Oh, hey, Peter, she smiled, just clearing snow. You know that dumb drunk dad of mine will never do it himself. She rolled her eyes, so I gotta do it myself. Need any help? I asked. Let me give you a hand. Two shovels will be faster than one. Really? She raised her eyebrows. Yeah, I am done with our yard. So, why not? I shrugged my shoulders. Plus, we are friends. Friends help each other. Friends? She smirked. All right then, let's clear this crap fast. We started shoveling the snow together. MJ has this cute little smirk on her face. Oops. She slipped and crash landed on me. We both laughed it off. Her body feels so soft and warm against mine. Damn. She smells so freaking good. Sorry, she giggled, sitting on my crotch. Don't worry about it, I smiled back. Her but feels so firm on me. You might want... I pointed at my crotch. Move a bit. Oh. Sorry. She jumped off me. Didn't notice. Her face flushed with embarrassment. Damn. She looks so damn hot when she blushes. We cleaned the snow for another half an hour or so and said our goodbyes. The rest of the day passed with a blink of an eye. Nothing interesting happened after that morning incident. And so, the days pass like a breeze. Today is the day for that genetic lab tour, where a spider will bite me, and I will get my power. I am excited and nervous at the same time. Time ago, MJ and I took the bus to school. But on the way, I didn't see Flash and his friends. Whatever, let's not waste the mood by thinking about those bastards. Omniscient third-person POV Flash and his four friends were sitting in the gym locker room. Well, the big guy is to get his right fist plastered after he punched the metal light post, trying to hit Peter at the bus stop that morning and to rub salt in the wound. Peter even embarrassed him in front of the public. He has never been humiliated in such a way in his life. He was supposed to be the alpha male around here, and Peter was supposed to be the little nerd loser who cowers in fear. But now, Peter has changed. He stood up to him and humiliated him in front of everyone. Flash couldn't stand it anymore. He hated Peter with every fiber of his being and wished he could beat the crap out of him. But with his broken fist, he knew he couldn't do it physically. Damn it, this still hurts like crap, he yelled. Peter Parker will freaking pay for this. Chill, dude, his friend patted his back. We will get him. Just wait and see. Yeah. We will teach that little nerd a lesson he will never forget, another friend added. Today is that stupid lab tour, isn't it? Flash sneered. I know Parker will be there. That nerd loves science and crap. What you got him on? The one on his right asked. Something he will never forget his entire life. I'm gonna put that little crap in bed for the rest of his life. Flash chuckled evilly. Damn it. Man, that's... I don't know about that. I mean, you wanna make him vegetable or something? His friend sounded worried. Relax. I'm not going to kill him or anything. He's just going to get into an accident during the tour. Something life-changing. Flash grinned. Why? Got cold feet, Jake? Nah. I am down for it, Jake shrugged his shoulders. As long as we don't get caught. We won't get caught. Trust me. Flash rubbed his broken fist. Parker deserves it. That little crap thinks he is better than me. Today... He will realize how weak and pathetic he is compared to me. They all laughed evilly. Peter and MJ arrived at the school, where the principal arranged a bus for the students to take to the genetic lab. 
Flash and his friends were already there waiting for Peter. But they didn't make their move on the bus because there were teachers around. They will wait till the lab tour starts. Peter's first person POV. Weird. These numb nuts aren't saying a word. Usually, they would try to bully me or something. Bastard must have learned his lesson. Oh, who am I kidding? He must be saving it for the tour. Whatever. Inside the bus, I got three options. Where the hell should I sit? There is Gwen, Michelle, and MJ sitting with a space empty beside them, and two of them smiling at me, except for Michelle, who just glanced at me and then went back to read whatever she was reading. Hey, Pete Harry came from behind. Hey, man. I greeted him back. You joining the tour too? Yup, he nodded. It's an Oscorp, so I thought, why not? Cool. I smiled. Come on, he went and took a seat at the back with his friends. Peter, what are you waiting for? When called out, I've saved a seat for you. I went and sat next to her. She smiled at me, and MJ smirked while Michelle kept reading. God damn it. The more girls you have, the harder it gets. So, I heard your little run with Flash. Gwen whispered in my ear, Way to stand up for yourself. Well, it was like I have had enough of his bullshit. I thought what would you do if you were in my place? I shrugged my shoulders. And she narrowed her eyes with a slight smile tugging the corner of her lips. And I just did it. You know, it felt great after standing up for myself. I felt like a huge boulder had been lifted off my chest. I sighed as I looked up at the bus's ceiling. Hey, Gwen. Yeah. She looked at me with her beautiful green eyes. Thank you for everything. I know you said no thanks or sorry among friends, but still, thanks for standing up for me all those times. You are truly amazing. I smiled. She blushed a little and smiled back. Damn, she looks even more beautiful when she smiles. Her blonde hair fell over her face and I wanted to brush it away, but I stopped myself before doing anything stupid. The ride was smooth and we finally reached Oscorp Genetic Lab. We got off the bus, and the guide started the tour. It was really interesting, and I was enjoying every moment of it. Flash and his friends haven't tried anything funny yet. After almost 30 minutes of touring the first lab, where they showed some crazy mutated chameleons capable of insane regeneration, well, they didn't actually cut them off before us, but the experimented data they showed on the screen showed that the chameleons were regenerating limbs and stuff in the blink of an eye. We moved to the next lab, which was the main attraction of the tour. They called it Spider Biodome. It was a huge dome full of spiders of different sizes and shapes. They were kept inside glass containers and were studied for their unique abilities. The guide explained how they study these spiders and use their DNA to create new formulas and stuff. Then there is this weird-looking spider, whose web, if processed properly, can become as strong as a Kevlar. Or the one with the blue dots, whose webs, if woven properly, can become elastic and stretchable. And lastly, the one with red and yellow stripes can weave webs that can cut through the strongest metal available on Earth, the freaking vibranium. Now we will move toward the main attraction of today, the 15 super spiders that have been genetically modified using multiple species of spiders, including the ones we have shown before. The guide announced, These 15 spiders are very dangerous and must be handled with utmost care. So, please keep your distance from the containers. We walked toward the center of the dome, where there were five rows of five containers each. Each container had a number plate with the spider species written on it. We slowly started walking among the containers. The guide told us to take pictures and record videos, so I pulled out my phone and started recording. Hey, are you sure it's 15? Michelle asked the guide. Yes. Why? The guide seemed confused. Michelle pointed at container 15, and the guide rushed toward it. My eyes followed her and saw that the spider inside wasn't there. This is it. The scenario. The freaking cannon event where the spider bites me and turns me into Spider-Man. Where the hell are you? I looked around, but nope, nothing. Maybe the scientist took it for testing or something. The guide replied, let's move on. Oh no, it's here somewhere. Hey, Parker, Flash approached me with his buddies. Oh, here we go again. What the hell do you losers want? Go away. I'm busy. I sighed as I looked around. Ah, don't tell me you are afraid of little spiders. Flash's friend snorted. Come on, Parker. He wrapped his arm around my shoulder. Don't worry. We are here to protect you. 
AJ, your dad needed that protection when he schmucked your mom. If he had, it could have saved our planet from another schmucker. Get that fapping arm away from me, you sicko. I ain't swing that way. I shoved him away, and he fell on the ground. His friends laughed while he got back on his feet and wiped the dust from his jeans. What's going on, Parker? Our science teacher walked toward us. Oh, I will tell you what's going on here. I turned toward her. These guys here think they can have some fun with me. Protect me as if I am their chick. I was like, what the hell, man? Get away from me. I don't swing that way. I mean, come on, teach. I'm trying to concentrate here, but these perverts... I think I will contact the disciplinary committee and take this matter to social media too. You alright, Pete? Harry came from behind. Yeah, I am good. But we need to decide what to do with these sickos. I narrowed my eyes at Flash. We should kick them off the tour or something, Gwen suggested. First bullying, and now this. Get out. I will bring this matter to the principal and the disciplinary committee. Bring your parents to school tomorrow. It's about time you guys learn some manners and Peter, I would request you not to do anything rash or take any matters to social media, the teacher requested. But, we, what? Flash scratched his head, trying to grasp what just happened. Leave, now, the teacher pointed towards the door. His friends looked at each other and followed their leader. The rest of the tour was boring. That freaking spider didn't even bite me. All thanks to that bastard. This is the final lab where they were experimenting with some kind of serum that was supposed to help people with weak metabolism to lead a normal life by strengthening their muscles and bones. Man, I gotta take a leak. I felt the sudden urge. I asked the teacher and ran to the bathroom. I followed the signs plastered on the wall. It was quite empty. I closed the door and as I was about to do my job, someone kicked my back hard. My head slammed on the wall and everything became dark. When I woke up, I was lying on the floor, my nose hurt, and I tasted the metallic taste of blood inside my mouth. There was also this slight pain in my head. My entire body ached, and my eyes felt like they had lost all the color. But only after a few seconds I realized what was happening. Someone beat me up to a pulp. Shit! I tried to stand up after spitting the blood. I'm gonna kill that flash bastard and his friends. I somehow walked up to the basin, washed the blood off my face and grabbed some tissues to wipe them. There was no sign of dust or anything on my clothes. I pulled up my shirt. Damn it. It hurts. Yup, it's not good. Those bastards took my clothes off and beat the crap out of me when I was unconscious. Huh. My arms. There were six bite marks. On both arms. And the rest were all over my body, freaking hard to count how many. I looked on the floor. There were a bunch of dead spiders, but nothing else. And they looked like those freaking super spiders. I counted them. 18 spiders in total. Three extra. How the hell did they manage to steal them? Those bastards were really trying to kill me. Forget that for now. I have no idea what's going to happen now. 18 spiders bite. Damn it. I dragged my feet out of the bathroom. And as I was walking through the hallways. Something familiar caught my eyes which forced me to forget all my pain and stop in my tracks. I walked over toward the room on my left with a half-open door and looked once again. Zero X Serum. On the self, there was this vial with the tag Zero X Serum written on it, sitting among many other vials. I looked around. Luckily, there weren't any CCTVs or guards. I pushed the door, went in, took the serum, and put it in my pocket. Then I walked out after waiting for those three lab code guys to pass, as if nothing had happened. I don't know who kept it there or how it was even there, but what I am sure is that this reality's version of me might not be alive anymore. Oscorp, one spider bite is alright, but freaking 18? 18, man. Do you have any idea what I'm feeling? This pain is not just physical. I have already noticed the changes, and honestly, I am freaking out. It's hard to explain, but it's like thousands of needles are stabbing my muscles all at the same time, and yet I am walking toward God knows where. I rubbed my eyes. Ah, there is the bus. I somehow got in and slumped on the seat before me. But hey, at least I stole that serum thing. Zero X serum. I remember those lunatics called me Subject Zero X in the past life when they were experimenting on my immunity power and how I healed super fast from all those chemicals, toxins, and drugs they were pumping into me. Maybe it could come in handy. Maybe. Who knows? I have no idea what's going to happen for as long as those damn bites keep affecting my body and mind. 
and I have no way of knowing if the serum is somehow related to me from this world or if someone just decided to use the same name. Dang, I can't feel my legs. Must be the poison of those freaking spiders. Should I take the serum? What if it nullifies the genetic mutation? No, I can't let this chance of gaining the spider power go to waste. Need to hold on? Must hold on? No, this isn't happening. What the hell is happening? It's like something is crawling under my skin, stretching my arms, and pushing against the surface. Oh no. No, no, no. Hallucinations. Damn it. Why are my eyes hurting like this? I grabbed my temples and groaned loudly. Look at this bastard. Flash's voice pulled me out of the weirdness inside my head. Karma, Parker. Karma is a bitch. You shouldn't have done that to us. At least he saved us the trouble by getting out of the bathroom. Jake chuckled. Let's beat him up again. Inside the building we couldn't do much, but here. Let's have some fun with him, boys. Flash sneered as his hand squeezed my throat and I gasped for air. Payback time, Parker. Just the five of us versus you. Gah! A hard punch in my abdomen, knocking the wind out of my chest. Then there was another and another. I couldn't even stand up straight or throw a single punch. My arms and legs were paralyzed and felt like jelly. All I could feel was pain. So much pain. Why so scared, Parker? One of them asked. Feeling helpless? Are we? No more fancy words. Look at yourself. You are a mess, boy. What are you, huh? Nothing. You're just an insect. I could hardly hear a single word coming out of their mouths. My brain was working hard to keep me conscious despite the immense amount of pain I was going through. Guess those spiders did their job, Flash said, pulling me back and punching me in the face. Shouldn't have messed with us, Parker. He threw me back, and I landed on the back seat of the bus, coughing up blood. This can't be true. This can't be real. Hey man, we got no more time. Strip this mother schmucker bear and leave him here. Let everyone see what a fool he was. Let him know what humiliation feels like. It took me a second to register what they said, and I tried to crawl away, only to get dragged and punched over and over again. What are you doing? Trying to get up, huh? Parker, we all know that you're nothing without your little nerd brains. There isn't anyone here to save you, but I lay there for a while, watching the sky turn dark and my breathing turning shallow. I wanted to scream, but the sound of my shattered rib cage stopped me. Tears ran down my cheeks, and I knew I couldn't win. I need to get out of here at any cost. This serum. I didn't think twice as I used my last ounce of strength to throw the small vial I was clenching in my fist into my mouth and broke it with my teeth. The serum coated my throat and spread through my veins quickly, burning and igniting every inch of my body. The glass shards of the vial stabbed me inside my mouth, but I kept swallowing until I saw the blood flowing out of my mouth. What the hell? Glass. Schmucker trying to kill himself. Jake's voice rang out. Damn it. Let's get out of here, Flash. We will get into trouble if anyone catches us with this schmucker. Damn you, Parker. Let's go. Just before the boys left, they kicked me several times, and my body went numb, unable to move even an inch. I stared up at the bus's ceiling. Everything is red. Red. So red. I can barely breathe. Buzz. 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 My phone vibrated on the seat beside me. Damn. This hurts like hell. I can't. I just... Everything turned dark as my consciousness faded away. Oscorp Genetic Research Lab. Omniscient Third Person POV. Where the hell is that serum? An old man in a lab coat yelled, his face beat red. If you lose it, he will take our heads. Find it. A team of scientists in full hazmat suits searched the place frantically. Check everywhere. A female voice ordered. Trust me. That serum is more costly than all of our lives combined. Doc, you have to calm down. Let's check the CCTVs. Maybe someone replaced it with or misplaced it. Do whatever you want. Just find the damn serum. The doctor banged his fists on the desk, scattering papers and equipment. Damn it. Norman is going to kill us. We were so close. The captain will be here in a week. We needed to remove the side effects. Freaking retards are all I have here with me. After the lab tour, the lab tour was over. The students got up on the bus, exhausted and sweaty. Harry, have you seen Peter? Gwen asked, her eyes scanning the bus. Huh, 
Harry's head jerked up, his face stained with concern. No. No. I thought he was with you. Not that I can tell. Didn't he meet up with you after the lab tour? No. He went to the restroom during the tour, but I thought he'd come back. He sighed, running his fingers through his hair. Man, this doesn't look good. I'll take a look. He dashed out of the bus and ran toward the building. Bad thoughts rampaging in his mind. The earlier incident with Flash and his gang made him extremely worried. After a while, he came back. You find him? Gwen asked nervously. No. I pulled up the cameras. He left early, he sighed in relief. He was in a hurry. Maybe going for another part-time job. Let me ring him. He pulled his cell phone out of his pocket and started calling. Gwen rubbed her temple, glancing up at Harry and dialing Peter's number, but there was no response from his side. I wonder what's gotten into him. We can't do anything until we know for sure. You worry too much, he shook his head and took a seat. He will be fine. Don't be paranoid. Just hope they didn't do anything to him, she thought silently as she tried not to think of the worst. MJ pulled out her phone after hearing about Peter leaving early and called him. But nope, nothing. She left a couple of text messages asking if everything was alright, but she didn't get a response back. Something was definitely odd. Hope he's okay. But this is not like him. MJ thought anxiously because he always replies almost instantly. She fidgeted in her seat, clutching her phone in her hand tightly, hoping Peter would call her back soon. Michelle noticed a little blood stain and a broken glass shard near her seat and picked it up. Ah, huh, that's weird. What could have caused this, she wondered. She touched the blood stain. It's dry. If it was recent, the blood should still be wet. She didn't know what to make of it. It couldn't have been Peter's. Somewhere in Manhattan, alley crap. Peter groaned in pain as he came to, his blurry vision becoming clear as he blinked repeatedly. Where the hell am I? It's already dark and snow has started to fall. Damn it. He groaned as he stood up, holding the wall for support. He staggered, trying to keep himself balanced and moving. What happened to me? He stumbled. Hey there, bro. A homeless guy helped him sit easy there. You look like crap, man. Got jumped or something? Thanks. Peter mumbled as his head started spinning, making him groan as the cold wind touched his wounds. I gotta go. Stay here for a bit, the homeless guy whispered, handing him his blanket. Let me go get some help. Where am I? He asked, realizing his jacket was open. We are directly on the opposite of the Daily Bugle. You live around here? The homeless guy asked as he lighted a cheap cigarette. Hope you don't mind. 20 Ingram Street, he mumbled, his eyes still hazy. Wait a minute. Aren't you that kid who delivers the newspapers almost every morning? The homeless guy suddenly asked, his eyes wide with interest. Come on, let me help you get home. I got a cart. So, hop in. He smirked, helping him get up and put him on the cart. Thank you. Peter lost consciousness once again as his savior pulled his cart. Peter's first person POV, slowly, I open my eyes. The snow is falling pretty heavily, and it looks like I'm lying on a cart. That guy even covered me with his blanket and is pushing this cart in this freaking snow. He is a homeless man, but he seems so kind and considerate. I doubt if it were any of the students or even some random stranger passing by, they might not have shown this kind of kindness. I am grateful, but oh my god, my body hurts so badly. I can feel my ribs ache and my eye is throbbing. Hey, what's your name? I asked the man softly. Joshua. Everyone calls me Josh. He smiles and lifts a corner of the blanket over me, covering my face from the snow. Thank you, Joshua. You didn't have to do this. I reply. Don't worry, son. I can understand what you are going through. You kept mumbling about some Flash or Jake. Did they beat you up? He asked gently. Yeah, I signed defeat. Yeah, they did. I almost died. I guess I was lucky you were there. So, they beat you up and no one did nothing? He asked with a hint of curiosity in his voice. Their school bullies got money, pays donations and all, and my school isn't so strict about such things. And frankly, I can't really afford to go to another school or quit my side jobs. I replied, wincing at my aching bones. Money is tight at home. I guess I'm just, I was just trying to get by quietly until something snapped and I decided to speak up and, huh, I chuckled bitterly. And this is the result, huh? He whispers, shaking his head, hey, have faith. There is a saying, 
No matter how deep a river of troubles you're stuck in, there are always a million bridges out there. Well, I haven't reached the millionth yet. I respond, grimacing. But one thing I know for certain, I'm going to have the last laugh someday. He pulled the cart under a closed shop as the snow fell heavier. He then crouched beside me. Revenge doesn't solve anything, son. It makes you do some dumbest crap. And then when the high wears off, you'll feel like crap. You sound like you're talking from experience. I ask, glancing at his eyes. Huh, you can say that. His smile is sad, and the scars on his face stand out in the glow of the lamplight. It was a long time ago. I did some stupid crap and bomb. I lost everything I had, including the love of my life and my family. Been homeless ever since. Oh, I sat up with great difficulty. Sorry for what happened. Eh, he shrugged. It is what it is. Besides, it was my fault. Huh? The cuts in my mouth were no more. The pain is subsiding slowly, and the feeling in my arms and legs is returning. Was the serum doing this? Was it healing me? Or spider power? Well, since we ain't going anywhere in this heavy snow, mind telling me what happened to you? I asked. It's not the greatest bedtime story, Joshua sighs, rubbing his neck. Trust me, I'm a good listener. And for a moment, he just stood there, looking at me before taking a seat. Before all of this happened, I was a software engineer at Oscorp. My wife, Alice, and I had just found out we were going to be parents. He smiled bitterly. We were very excited. He paused as he took out his worn-out wallet and took out an old picture of a little girl. This is her, he smiled sadly. Sarah, I looked at the beautiful little girl, who couldn't be older than five or six. Her eyes twinkled with joy, and a beautiful smile lit up her angelic face. She is beautiful, I whisper, handing him back the picture. Yes, she is. His voice shakes a bit. One day, there was an attack by this group of people, who later turned out to be eco-terrorists. They believed Oscorp was corrupting the environment and animals were dying. So, they started targeting low-level workers like us, not caring what the truth was. They began to harass us in public and at home. It became so severe that I had to request for a leave, and I even had to file a lawsuit, but it wasn't enough. He stood up, throwing the cigarettes away, and paced in frustration. One day, Alice went to the supermarket and never came back home. Later, cops found her dead in the alley, and it turns out the eco-terrorists did it. They beat her up and tortured her, killed her. I sat there, listening to him silently. How horrible. I'm so sorry for your loss. That day when I saw her lying in a pool of blood, something broke within me. I wanted to kill that bastard myself. But the cops arrested him, and for some damn reason, they decided to let him go free without any charges. I hacked into the CCTV and saw that bastard kill her. I knew I couldn't trust the authorities, so I followed him and found where he lived. That night, I went home, took my shotgun, went to that mother schmucker and blew his head off before his wife and son. He paused for a minute as he took out another cigarette. What about his wife and son? I asked curiously. They didn't do nothing to me or my family, so after I shot that bastard, I surrendered and explained everything to the cops. I got lucky. The higher-ups launched another investigation and found out that bastard I shot was actually a real terrorist, and that family of his was just a cover-up. That bastard was holding them hostages and was using them as a front. He frowned. But those cops? He shook his head. I spent 20 years in prison, but hey, at least I took the bastard down. Your daughter? I asked gently. She was six years old back when I was jailed, so she got adopted by a nice family. He puffed on his cigarette. Then, well, when I got out, I tried to find her, but it was useless. I spent everything I had to find my daughter, but he turned away from me. For a moment, no one spoke as we both sat there silently. I don't know where she is. It's been over 20 years since I saw her. His voice faltered and he dropped his head. After a moment, he stood up and stared at me. Revenge is a damn mistake. Trust me. Had I not done that, maybe, just maybe, I could have moved on. But, he looked away. Anyway, that's enough. I'm here now. I got down from the cart. My body has healed up. No more pain or grogginess. I'll be direct with you. Have it ever occurred to you that the guy you killed, maybe one of their mates might have used some kind of front 
and taken away your daughter? I asked as I stretched my body, still a little stiff but feeling much better. What? He muttered shocked. Meet me in that same alley in a month. You want to find your daughter, right? I patted his shoulder and began to walk into the snowstorm. Hey, what the? What do you mean? He stammered, chasing behind me. If you were thinking what I think you were thinking, then you're mad. It's impossible. The dirty cops who let that prick go. You remember their face, right? In a month, I won't promise anything, but I will try my best to help you. Think of it as thanks for saving my sorry, but... I walked away, leaving the baffled homeless man, who mumbled to himself. Who the hell was that weird kid? First, he fights with the school bullies, then gets beaten up to a pulp. Wait, how the hell did he recover so fast? He paused for a moment before yelling, I will wait for you, kid. Don't forget. Don't you freaking forget it. I can feel it. My body feels light as a feather. I can see clearly in this dark snowstorm, and I am not feeling any cold or anything. My head is clear. The pain is no more. I walked up to a nearby wall and touched a poster that someone had spray-painted on. As I pulled my hand away, the poster got stuck to my palm. Holy crap. It's just like that Spider-Man movie. It took a few tries to get that poster away from my hand. Then I looked around. Well, there isn't anyone in the area. I gritted my teeth and punched the wall hard. A bit too hard. Boom. Crack. A chunk of bricks flew off in the sky. I clenched my fist with a grin. Hell yeah. I am coming for you, Flash. Huh. I felt a weird sensation around my wrists. It was as if something was moving, trying to come out. Web. Organic web? Maybe? I did the sign of Spider-Man to fire a web and hit a tree on the other side. I gave a long whistle in awe. That's it. That is the power of being Spider-Man. But this weird sensation. I released the web and checked my wrists. Something hard is... Spurt. Freaking hell? Peter's first person POV. But this weird sensation. I released the web and checked my wrists. Something hard is... Spurt. Freaking hell? Two claws busted out of my wrists splattering blood everywhere in that dark snowstorm. It was so cold that I didn't feel any pain, but the throbbing sensation in my arms wasn't a pleasant one. I waddled under a lamppost and examined them. Blackish blue. They have a scaly texture with blood dripping from them. I slashed it on the lamppost. Clink. It's sharp. Really freaking sharp, and it looks pretty durable too. It slides through a post like a hot knife through butter. Holy crap. The post fell with a loud bang along with the electric wires. I dashed off toward my house. Don't want to make May any more worried than necessary. I'm already too late. While running, I noticed that my speed was way faster and my eyesight was far keener. In the blink of an eye, I was able to jump four to six floors at once. And it feels effortless and even liberating. Jumping from roof to roof, from walls to posts, in less than 30 minutes, I reach my house. Um, my claws. I didn't even notice when they returned inside. It is 9 p.m. and the neighborhood seems so quiet. I turn toward MJ's house. Her room's light is still on. I would have paid her a visit if not for this damn storm. Well, I took out the spare key and went inside the house. May was waiting in the living room with a cup of coffee in her hand, watching the news. Oh, Peter, she exclaimed. Where the hell have you been? It's so late and this storm and she stopped the moment she noticed my bruises and the frozen blood all over my clothes she froze for a second before dropping the coffee peter are you okay are you hurt oh my god she cut my cheek with a teary smile and yelled why the hell were you outside in this goddamn blizzard i am all right not hurt or anything i got a little bit held up i reply slowly but she stammered I grabbed her arms. I am sorry for worrying you, M.A. I wanted to call you, but my phone is dead. I'm so sorry. May stared at me trying to see if I got into an accident, but there wasn't a single scratch on me. But, what's this red thing on you? And your clothes? She asks, frowning at the stain on the arm of my torn uniform. No idea. I slipped around the corner. Might have got something from there. I answered feigning ignorance. You know how clumsy I am. I shrugged with an embarrassed chuckle, rubbing my neck. Still, Peter, don't ever do that again. You get it, young man? She rubbed my arms. Now go and get cleaned up. Take a warm bath, or you will catch a cold. 
The word cold gave me a shudder. It's as if all of a sudden, all the cold hit me at once, and all I wanted was a warm bath and a steaming cup of coffee. I nodded and went upstairs to clean myself. But before that, I made sure I wrapped my blood-soaked uniform in a bag and locked it away in the closet. Then took a quick warm shower. After that, I went to my room with a towel wrapped around my waist. I walked in front of the mirror and checked my body carefully. Well, aside from the newly grown muscles, there aren't any other changes. I can see clearly and hear almost everything, even a small flies buzz. Suddenly, my stomach growled loudly. I am starving. I quickly changed my clothes and went to the kitchen. May has already prepared our dinner for us. It wasn't anything fancy, but my taste buds were celebrating when I devoured noodles and meatballs. We watched the news while eating, which was filled with reports of snowstorms causing various accidents, including a freight train accident. It went on and on. So how was the lab tour, Peter? May asked suddenly. It was somewhat fun, I replied, keeping the details hidden. What about you? How was your day? Well, same old, working home, that's it. Although today was a half day, because of the weather, gosh, I thought it would be warmer by now. She grumbled. The rest of the dinner went on like that while we talked about a lot of random things like what MJ and the others were up to lately. After we finished our meals, we decided to go to bed early. Good night, May. I stretched my arms as I stood up, yawning. She nodded with a smile. How about a good night kiss? She chuckled teasing me. I walked over to her, leaning down slightly. I kissed her lips. So soft. Good night, May, I said again, and this time I kissed her again. She didn't pull away either. Instead, she pressed her lips and sucked mine a little bit, sending shivers down my spine. It was merely less than 10 seconds, but her deep breathing sent a surge of shaboink hunger throughout my body. I know where this is going, and I don't mind it. It's more about... What are her thoughts? Good night, Peter. That was... Wow. She said with a weird tone, and a slight blush crept on her cheeks. She looked at me for a couple of seconds, unsure of what to say next. Well, that was good. Have sweet dreams. She said before returning to the bedroom hurriedly. God damn. I did it. I kissed her, and it worked. A victorious grin appeared on my face. My lips are tingling, and... I noticed a slight bulge in my jeans. The memories of that day flashed before my eyes when I saw her rubbing her coochie mumbling my name. That g and boobs and her dripping coochie. Crap. Let's take it slow, Peter. As the saying goes, slow and steady wins the race. Well, this one is a different race and we should approach it carefully and properly. I am just a soul in Peter's body, so it's alright. I told myself, it's fine, isn't it? I went to my room after checking the locks and security around the house. I lay on my bed, checking my wrists. Those two claws were freaking dangerous. I have to learn how to control them and this new power of mine. Reading a comic book and knowing the power of Spider-Man is different from experiencing it. It was exciting but also kind of scary and thrilling if I'm being completely honest. First learn to control my power, then make a suit, and last but not least beat the crap out of those villains. One day soon, the city will have a new hero, and who knows, if things go well, I might be able to join the Avengers. Then, I can get those cool high-tech suits. But, right now, I wonder if my organic web has any unique properties or not. So I did it. The sign that Spidey makes while shooting his webs, just like before. For a while, nothing happened, but then I noticed a tingling feeling around my wrists. Two thick, sticky strands popped out. Yes! just like that and stuck to the ceiling fan. Nice. Organic web is very convenient. I don't have to worry about web shooters getting damaged. I could swing freely around the city using these webs. Now that's just awesome, isn't it? It has great tinsel strength and is self-created. Now how about grabbing the web strands? I lifted myself easily above the bed, dangling upside down, hanging by my webs. Cool. Now let's try crawling on the wall. I pulled myself to the ceiling, sticking firmly without falling back down. Awesome. This is so easy and fast. I crawled around my room like a little kid discovering Christmas presents for the first time. This is amazing. I thought it would be hard, but I guess it's not that hard. I crawled upside down, then jumped back to my bed effortlessly. 
All it takes is practice, and I will become a professional very soon. Anyway, I am so sleepy. I yawned loudly. Well, it's already midnight, and tomorrow is Saturday. Time to sleep. I'll figure out the rest later. May's third-person POV. May hurried to her room and closed the door. She stood there, pressing her back to the door, touching her lips. She could still feel Peter's warmth. Not only that, but she couldn't understand why she did that, but she knew it was wrong yet so right. The way he responded to her, it felt magical. The way he leaned down to kiss her, damn it, I am going crazy. She cursed under her breath, but licked her lips nevertheless. God, his lips were so soft. I almost gave in. Did he notice? She wondered. Crap. She walked over to the bedside desk and unlocked it. Before her eyes was a pink vibrator egg with a remote control. She took it and lay on the bed, spreading her legs. She removed her undies and went to work, playing with herself. Moments later, Huff! Phew! I doubt I ever climaxed this hard before. She commented while panting heavily. Her limbs were numb, and her coochie was sore, but she was satisfied. Peter, my sweet nephew, he is growing up into a fine man, she thought, smiling to herself. Whom I wonder, ha, huh? she chuckled bitterly. Who would be interested in a middle-aged woman like me? Especially Peter, he deserves someone younger and prettier than me. She sighed, leaving the egg inside as she put the speed to a minimum. She quickly changed the bedsheet and lay on the bed undressed, under the blanket, wondering if her wild dreams would ever come true. Peter, she mumbled his name while drifting to sleep. Peter's first person POV. Morning, a large one escaped my mouth as I opened my eyes. I sat up on the bed, rubbing my eyes. Hmm. I glanced at the clock. It was seven o'clock. Saturday. Well, two days holiday. Nice. I stretched, my body feeling refreshed after a good night's sleep. The bad memories of getting almost killed by Flash and his mates, and the good memories of getting my spider power flooded my mind. I shook off the bad thoughts because the time for thinking is over. I will beat the crap out of that mother schmucker today. I know where he hangs out. Oh, he will regret it soon enough. But right now, I got off the bed, heading straight to the bathroom for a morning shower. I pushed the door open. Huh. Before my eyes stood May, completely undressed, drying her hair with a towel. I froze on the spot, staring at her heavenly figure from head to toe. My meat grinder sprang up instantly. She turned around. Ha! Huh. Both of us were stunned for a moment. May covered her private parts while I averted my gaze, looking everywhere but her. Oh, sorry. I didn't mean to. Sorry. I apologized awkwardly scratching the back of my head as I quickly left the bathroom, closing the door behind me. I let out a sigh of relief. Phew. That was close. She is so beautiful. I thought as I walked toward the kitchen. May followed me, wearing only a bathrobe. Peter. She called out to me shyly. I stopped in my tracks and turned around. I am sorry. The door was open and... I apologized again, feeling a little awkward and horny. She approached me. No, it was my fault. I should have locked it. And about yesterday, she trailed off, fidgeting with her robe nervously. Ah, did you perhaps not like me kissing on your lips? I asked worriedly. She blushed a little, shaking her head. No, I loved it. I heaved a sigh of relief hearing her. Then what is it about? I asked curiously. She hesitated a bit before speaking up. Peter, can you do it every night before going to bed? She requested shyly while blushing like a high school girl confessing her crush. You mean good night kiss like yesterday? I asked raising my eyebrow. She nodded cutely. Sure, May. Anything for you? I smiled at her. Her face brightened up hearing me. She tiptoed and kissed my cheek. Thank you, Peter. And sorry about that incident. I guess we're even now, huh? I smirked a bit. She saw me but undressed once, and now I saw her, well, more than twice undressed. Yeah, I guess. She giggled cutely covering her mouth with her delicate hands as she went to her room. I took a deep breath feeling relieved. My heart was hammering against my chest like crazy, seeing May undressed earlier. She was so hot. Damn. I rubbed my temple trying to calm myself down. And here we were talking as if nothing happened. God, I am so freaking lucky to have such a hot aunt. Wait, 
She asked me to kiss her every night before going to bed. Does it mean what I think it means? Hell yeah. Hell yeah. I pumped my fist in the air excitedly. After breakfast, my daily duty began. Cleaning the snow from the yard, and I think I have to clean the roof too. I finished cleaning the yard faster since it wasn't snowing anymore. I cleaned the roof next which took me a couple of hours. After all that hard work, I wasn't even exhausted. Super endurance, huh? Interesting. Hey, Peter. MJ yelled from below. I waved at her standing on the roof. Hey, MJ. What's up? She came closer. Where the hell did you disappear during the tour? Do you know how worried everyone was? We tried to call you, but your phone was out of reach. I climbed down the ladder and answered. Sorry about that. I went for my part-time job, but my phone was dead. Stan's pizza joint was closed and I got caught up in the storm. It was a hell of a night. I explained briefly, avoiding unnecessary details. MJ listened attentively and narrowed her eyes at me. You sane up there? She touched my forehead. I know I messed up. I sighed. She punched my arm lightly. Idiot. Don't disappear like that ever again. All right? You had no idea how worried we were. I nodded obediently. Yes, yeah, sorry. Won't happen again. You should watch the news more often. They already announced that it would snow heavily last night. H-A-A. She sighed, shaking her head, disappointed. Anyway, you free today? Want to go for a little walk? I, I just need to get away from that drunk father of mine. She asked hesitantly. Sure thing. You had breakfast yet? I asked casually. She shook her head. Not really. I grinned, widely grabbing her wrist. Come on then. May made pancakes for breakfast. Join us. I dragged her toward my home. Wait. You sure about that? I just don't want to bother you guys. She refused politely. I turned around walking backward facing her. Bother? Nah. You know she likes you, right? Come on. I reassured her and dragged her inside the house. After breakfast, MJ and I decided to go for a walk. The government workers were busy clearing the roads. I wore a black hoodie and blue jeans, while MJ wore a red winter coat and white pants. It's freezing cold. She hugged herself, shivering a little. So, any plans for this Christmas? She asked me casually. Nothing much, probably hanging around or something. I shrugged my shoulders. What about you? I asked her back. She looked away, sighing. Same old crappy life? Probably gonna stay at Gwen's place this Christmas. She replied gloomily. I wish my life was better. She mumbled to herself. Hey, cheer up. I nudged her. I'm sure your life will get better. I assured her. She just chuckled. I hope you are right, Peter. She smiled a little. We walked for some more time, enjoying each other's company, until we reached the park. The kids were playing in the snow, happily laughing and running around. It reminded me of the time when Peter was a kid. He used to play with Uncle Ben and Aunt May. Those were good days. Hey, want to make a snowman? I pointed towards the snow-covered ground. She smirked looking at me. Really now? Come on, it will be fun. I insisted. Besides, it's not like you got anything better to do. So? She thought for a moment before smiling. Why not? We both sat down in the snow, starting to make a snowman. She gathered the snow, forming a ball while I tried making another one. We made three balls and stacked them on top of each other, forming a snowman. It looks horrible, MJ said looking at the snowman. Hey, don't say that. This just needs a little extra touch. I defended our creation. I grabbed two twigs, placing them as the arms of the snowman, while she placed stones as the eyes and nose. There, now it doesn't look bad. She commented standing next to me admiring our work. Although it still needs something, she suggested. Like what? I asked her raising an eyebrow. Like this. She grabbed some snow throwing it at me. I dodged the snowball smirking. Oh, so that's how we were doing it? I picked up some snow forming a ball throwing it at her. She blocked the incoming snowball using her hand before gathering more snow. You can never win against me. I taunted her dodging another snowball. We'll see about that. She threw another snowball hitting me on my shoulder. We both kept throwing snowballs at each other dodging most of the attacks. At first, I let her hit me a few times, but soon I stopped holding back and started dodging every attack effortlessly. You missed. I dodged another snowball throwing one myself and hitting her in her face. See? Told you. You can't beat me. I teased her. Shut up. She shouted, 
throwing a snowball aiming at my face. Unfortunately for her, I ducked, dodging the attack. She growled in frustration, throwing more snowballs at me, which I dodged easily. Soon enough, I ran out of snowballs. Time out. I raised my hands, signaling surrender. Oh, no, you don't. She said, throwing a snowball, aiming at my chest. I jumped on my left, ducking behind the bench, dodging the attack. MJ, come on. Let's stop. I peeked from the bench, dodging another snowball. No. She shook her head, throwing another snowball. Not until I hit you. Fine. I sighed, jumping over the bench, dodging another snowball. She formed another snowball, throwing it at me. This time, instead of dodging, I rolled on the ground, taking a handful of snow, aiming it at her. She gasped, covering her face, blocking my attack. Gotcha. I smirked proudly, standing up. That's not fair. How are you dodging all my attacks? She complained, folding her hands. Because I'm just too good. I boasted, striking a pose. Swoosh. A snowball hit my face. I rubbed my face, wiping the snow off my face, glaring at MJ, who stood there grinning. What happened, Parker? Too good up? She mocked me. Oh, it's on. We played for hours, lost in time like kids again. After hours of playing around, we both lay exhausted on the snowy ground, catching our breath. I had a lot of fun today. MJ turned her head, facing me. Thank you, Peter. I am glad to see her smiling. Hope this takes some of her worries away for now. Besides, I had fun too, running and laughing without any worries. Anytime, MJ, I smile back. Want to grab a bite? I sat up patting snow off my clothes. Sure. She sat up dusting off the snow from her clothes. We both headed towards the cafe, grabbing some coffee and muffins. I still remember when we were kids, we used to build snowmen, have snow fights. MJ reminisced, taking a sip from her coffee. Yeah, good times. I nodded, sipping my own coffee. Now that I am here right now, talking to you, I realize how much things changed. Sometimes I wish those days would return. She sighed, putting her cup on the table. But the best thing right now is the new Peter before me. Oh, you like the new me, huh? I wiggled my eyebrows, earning a chuckle from her. Shut up. She rolled her eyes, taking another sip from her coffee. After having coffee, we both walked outside and headed back to my house. Huh, what the hell is this feeling? This weird, tingling sensation around my body. Something bad is going to happen. I stopped walking, scanning my surroundings carefully. MJ noticed my actions and stopped walking, looking at me curiously. Peter, what's wrong? She asked me worriedly. I can barely hear what she's saying. All my senses are telling me to run. Something dangerous is going to happen. I grabbed MJ, pulling her into a nearby alley. Wah. Before she could ask me, I put my finger on her lips, silencing her. Five bikes stopped near the cafe where we were previously sitting. Five masked men wearing leather jackets jumped off the bikes, drawing their guns. They stormed inside the cafe, firing their guns randomly. People screamed, panicking, trying to run away from the shooters. These bastards, with the snow and slippery roads, the police will never reach here in time. Damn it, I can't just stand here doing nothing. But I just got my powers yesterday. Can I really fight these guys? No choice. I need to act now. But I can't leave just like that with MJ with me. Peter, she whispered, tugging my sleeve, snapping me out of my thoughts. This is dangerous. We should leave. I grabbed her arm and dashed. Wait, what about those people? We should call the cops. She questioned me, pulling her arm back. I took out my phone and dialed 911, informing them about the shooting. I called the cops. They will handle them. I assured her, grabbing her arm again. They got guns and God knows what. We can't deal with them. After running to a safe distance, we stopped, catching our breath. Are you okay, MJ? I asked her, panting. Yeah, I am fine. She panted, leaning against the wall. Where is it? I put my hand in my back pocket, pretending to search for something. Shit. What? She looked at me, confused. My wallet. It must have fallen somewhere. I pretended to look worried. You ain't going there, are you? She narrowed her eyes, folding her arms. Don't worry, MJ. I will be back in a second. I gave her a thumbs up, turning around. No way in hell. She grabbed my arm, stopping me. We don't even know how many of them are there. We only saw five of them entering the cafe. 
What if there are more outside? Keeping an eye around. Just stay here. I will be back in a sec. I promise. I will turn back immediately if I spot someone. I assured her letting go of her hand. Pete. Before she could finish, I ran. Sorry. I gave her an apologetic smile, sprinting towards the cafe. I can't wait to put my power to the test. I'm going to slice them up like butter. Alley around the cafe. The civilians around the area have already run away after hearing the gunfire. The bikes were still parked near the cafe entrance, with no sign of anyone around. I hid behind the alley, scanning the area carefully. There's this white minivan waiting just opposite the cafe. Must belong to these idiots. Should I destroy the van? Nah, too noisy. Sabotage, perhaps? But I still need something to cover my face. Ah, a paper bag. Well, better than nothing. I grabbed the paper bag, put it over my head, and then pulled my hoodie over my head. I tore two small holes in it to see. Perfect. Let's do this. I sneaked behind the van and rolled under it. I could sense there are three of them inside this van. It's a weird feeling. I mean, I can see the outlines of the bodies through my spidey sense. One of them is eating something while the other two are smoking. Disgusting pigs. Now, how to bring out these claws? I clench my fist, imagining the feeling from last night when the claws came out from my wrists. Nothing. Maybe I need to imagine something sharp coming out of my fists? Still nothing. Damn it. How the hell do these claws come out? Okay, calm down. Think about slicing something apart. My hands started tingling a little. Come on. Slicing something apart. My claws slowly came out from my wrists, ripping through my flesh. Damn it. I gritted my teeth, suppressing my screams. Okay, this freaking hurts, but no blood this time. That's a good sign. Shaking the pain away, punctured the tires first before cutting open the fuel tank, letting the oil flow out. Next, I pierced the brakes, damaging them completely. Once done, I rolled out and hid behind the tree next to the van. Dang, my claws are sharp like last night. It took me 10 seconds to cut through everything. Okay, Pete, stay focused. They will be out any moment. I retracted my claws. The door of the van opened revealing one of the thugs wearing a white shirt and blue jeans. What the hell? He's a freaking tall guy, muscular too. His hair is black with a bushy mustache. He inspected the tires, cursing. Damn bitch. Who the hell did this? He shouted, kicking the tire angrily. Oi. Oh. He hissed, kneeling down, grabbing his toe. Freaking idiot. The other two came out to inspect the tires, too. The tires are freaking flat. The short, fat, bald man informed the third man. The third man was skinny, wearing a gray jacket, black jeans, and a mask similar to a ski mask. God damn it. What the? His eyes fell on the dripping oil as he bent down to check the tires. Someone cut the fuel tank. And the brakes, too. He cursed, standing up and clenching his fist. Find the bastard. I want him alive. Yes, boss. Both the fat man and the tall man replied in unison. As much as I would love to kill them, I can't do that. I need to keep my image clean to join the Avengers. For now, I will just cut off a few fingers or a limb or two. Art, what the hell am I thinking? I will just beat them up. Lucky for me, they aren't carrying their weapons. The two of them searched around while the skinny bastard stayed by the van, tapping his foot impatiently. The tall guy is coming toward me. Time to strike. I shot a web, pulling the tall guy towards me, dragging him behind the tree. Before he could react, I punched him in his face, knocking him out cold. Then, I webbed him to the tree, leaving him unconscious. That felt good. One down, two more to go. But, oh my, what do you got there in your pockets? I took out his wallet. Dang, tigaribu dollar. Thanks for the donation. I stuffed the cash in my pocket. I need to look out for my fingerprints can't let the cops find anything related to me. I'll hold on to this wallet for now. Next, time to put the fatty to sleep. I picked up a pebble aiming at the fatty. Bullseye. I hit him right in his head. Spat. E. I. I didn't mean to do that. The pebble pierced through his head like a freaking bullet. Holy Stark. Okay, Pete. Focus. Just focus on the remaining guy. One dead guy is alright, right? As long as he dies silently. Nobody will know. Yup, nobody will know. Besides, he is a bad guy. So it's alright to kill bad guys, right? What the freaking hell? The skinny one looked back and quickly ducked behind the van. Sniper. Damn it. 
He cursed looking around trying to find me. Alright buddy, I ain't a sniper, but why not pretend to be one for a change? I took a couple of peebles and climbed up the tree. It was covered with snow and was a good hiding spot. I aimed at the skinny bastard hitting him on his shoulder. Ark, bastard, he cried out loud clutching his shoulder as the pebble pierced through his flesh. I threw two more pebbles, aiming at his arms and legs, piercing through them. He blacked out for a moment experiencing the intense pain. He just laid down on the ground holding his wounded limbs. Poor bastard, we are under fire. Snee, mom. The skinny bastard tried to scream sniper so I webbed his mouth shut. I don't want the others to hide in thinking there's a sniper out here. That will only complicate things. With all his limbs injured, the skinny bastard struggled on the ground wriggling like a worm. Sorry buddy, I pulled him under the van. You gotta stay like that for a bit longer. I jumped down climbing inside the van through the window. Yuck, smells like cigarettes and rotten food in here. I checked the glove compartment finding a Glock pistol along with four magazines. I looked back. A couple of micro Uzis too. I don't need them. The thing I need is a lighter. I dragged the dead guy and the skinny inside the van. The skinny was already out. I checked their pockets, taking out their wallets. Wow, another $2,500. Damn, these bastards carry quite a lot of cash. I threw the wallet I picked up earlier and threw it in the van. Okay, Pete, time to burn them. Just like Salazar said, dead men tell no tales. I lighted two cigs and threw one under the van on the spilled oil. As for the second one, I opened the gas cap, stuffing it inside the tank. Then I dashed back into that alley. Damn it, I killed a guy and another one is about to die, yet I am so calm. Yes, bad guys should die, no need to feel remorse about killing them. I watched as the van burst into flames, burning everything in it. The skinny guy woke up screaming in agony due to the heat. Poor bastard. His cries soon died down as his body turned to ashes. The thugs from the cafe rushed out in shock watching the van burn to ashes. Damn, who the hell did this? Where are Alvin and Fred? The short fat baldy screamed, looking around nervously. Mother schmuckers, I told them not to touch that freaking new fire grenade. Look what happened, new fire grenade? Huh, idiot, that's just an ordinary cigarette and some gasoline. The siren of the police cars echoed through the streets. Damn, you retard bastards. He cursed, get the cash, we are leaving now. Before they could run back inside, once more to grab their money, I dashed in, time to web them up. I webbed the fat baldy, sticking him to the wall. The two burly guys aimed their rifles at me shooting wildly. I dodged the bullets with ease. I don't even know how I did it. It just happened like my body moved on its own. I webbed their rifles, pulling them away from their hands. Then, I punched them hard in their faces, knocking them out. The other two with shotguns aimed their guns at me, firing away. I jumped high in the sky, webbing them up with me and slamming them hard on the ground. Crack! Oh! I heard their bones cracking. Damn! Did I kill them too? Holy mother of Jesus! What the hell was that? The fat baldy panicked looking at me. I webbed his mouth, shutting him up. Shut up, baldy! The police siren is nearing the cafe. Time to get out of here. I webbed on top of the cafe, then swung away with my amateur skill, almost falling down in the next lane. Man, that felt great. Beating those bastards up. This power of mine is amazing. It feels great. I dodged freaking bullets without breaking a sweat. Those jerks couldn't even lay a single finger on me. I webbed down in an alley away from the scene and took the paper bag off my head. Man! Fighting bad guys is fun. Man, with great power, comes great loot. I walked back to where I left MJ standing. Peter, MJ came running with a worried look on her face. Well, can't blame her. She probably saw the explosion and heard the gunshots. Are you okay? Are you hurt somewhere? Don't worry. I am fine. I smiled taking out my wallet. Found it near the alley. Must have fallen when we were running. She sighed in relief, hugging me tight. Gosh, I was so scared. Yeah, me too. Thankfully, the police arrived just in time. I lied, hugging her back. Okay, this is new. Hugging MJ feels nice. Her soft body pressing against mine. Whoa, calm down, Pete. Calm down. Let's leave this place.
Shall we? I suggested. Oh, I have. She cleared her throat, letting go of me blushing. Sure. She sure looks cute when she blushes, and this is the first time she hugged and showed concern for me like this. Well, it kind of feels nice. We walked back home with an awkward silence surrounding us. The day started good for me, but not for her. I wanted her to smile and get all those bad thoughts off her head, but in the end, trouble found us, and I made her worried. H.A.A. Why can't things go perfect? Peter thanks. MJ spoke, breaking the silence as we reached our houses. For what? Thank you for being there with me today. She blushed a little. You're a good friend, Peter. And I had fun today despite what happened. Friend, huh? Well, it's a start. I smiled, nodding my head. No worries. I enjoy today, too. We should do that more often. MJ smiled, nodding her head. I will wait for your call, then. She giggled, walking inside her house. Hey. I called, stopping her. She turned around with a smile on her face. Do you want to go to the movies in the evening? Of course, if it doesn't snow again. Her eyes sparkled, nodding her head. Sure. Cool. I will pick you up at 7 then. I grinned. See you later. She waved goodbye, closing the door behind. Wow. What's happening to me? I touch my chest. My heart is beating too fast. That slight smile in the corner of her lips. Her sparkling eyes. That giggle. Everything feels mesmerizing. It's different from when I was with Gwen and Michelle. Different feeling. Different emotions. Is this because of the muscle memories of this body? Or could it be that his memories are affecting me? Either way, I need to calm myself before meeting MJ in the evening. Can't act weird and ruin everything. The rest of the day went by in a flash. I did some chores around the house. The fuse again went off, so I fixed it again. After I win the lottery in a few days, I will do some fixing around the house and buy some new stuff. Aunt May deserves the best after taking care of me all these years. Then, I finished my homework which was actually very easy since I already knew most of the topics. After lunch, I helped May to clean up the dishes, she also joined me. How's MJ doing? May asked, drying the dishes as I washed them. She's good, though she's still struggling with family issues. That poor child. Her dad must be going through a tough time. Having no job and losing his savings isn't something easy to handle. He drank and gambled it away. You don't call that having a tough time? I replied with a frown on my face. He wasn't like that at the beginning. After his wife's death, he fell into depression and started drinking and gambling. Poor man. She sighed, shaking her head. Well, I know how it feels to lose someone close. At least I can understand that feeling because even in this body, whenever I think about Ben Parker, I feel sad and a weird feeling grasps my heart. Maybe this sadness belongs to Peter Parker and his feelings towards Ben are transferring to me? But how can he torture his own daughter? Shouldn't he be more mature? I complained handing over the last plate to May. I mean, he should take care of her instead of cursing her. She is the only family he has left, and I doubt the last thing his wife would have wanted is to see her daughter suffering in the hand of her drunkard husband. She didn't reply sighing, looking at the plates in her hands. May loves MJ, so it must be hard for her to see MJ suffer every day. He needs a psychiatrist, doesn't he? And they can't afford it now. I muttered, wiping my hands. May nodded her head. Let's say I get lots of money, and if I pay for his treatment... She would feel bad? Do you think that I am helping her out of pity? I asked, leaning against the kitchen sink and crossing my arms over my chest. I didn't get the chance to make many friends in my previous life due to those lunatics. Anyway, right now, with my friends suffering daily right before my eyes, I just, I just can't stay still and watch her suffer. I want to help her out. You want to help him? She asked, putting the plates back into the cabinet. Not him, but her. She's... She's important to me. I stuttered, scratching the back of my neck. She chuckled, smiling. I see. Let me ask you one thing. Are you going to help her out of pity? Of course not. She's my friend and friends help each other. Don't they? She nodded her head, patting my shoulder. Then it's fine. Helping someone out of pity is wrong, but helping your friend isn't. If you really want to help her, then you should. Just don't forget to discuss it with her before helping. Otherwise... She might misunderstand you. She advised. 
We finished cleaning the dishes, and May went to relax while I decided to check if I had any more new hidden powers apart from the regular Spidey power and those claws. So far, I got the organic web, spider sense, super strength, and agility. I can also stick to things, but that's basic. Apart from these and those claws, I wonder what else I have. Since I was bitten by approximate 18 spiders, maybe each spider gave me its unique power. Plus, I took that serum. It's a messed up mess, but I will figure it out sooner or later. Although it seems funny, I tried various signs to check. You never know when another ability pops out. Wow, talking about pop, organic web shot out from the tips of my fingers just now. <clears throat> cool. With a bit of focus, I was able to detach them. They aren't sticky, but elastic. Could come in handy sometimes. I wonder how strong these new web threads are. I threw two web shots, sticking them to the wall, creating a swing-like structure. I jumped on it testing its durability, and it was pretty stable. I did a couple of jumps on it, and it looks pretty durable. Then, I opened the drawer with my web, pulling out a knife from it. I tried to slice it with the knife, but it didn't work. I increased the pressure trying to cut it, yet failed. Well, this web is stronger than steel. Good to know. What else? I have no idea how to figure it out. Guess I will find it out on the go. 7 p.m. Luckily, no snowfall till now. I checked the weather forecast, and it said the snowfall won't continue until next week. So, hopefully, I can enjoy without any disturbance. After freshening up, I wore my black shirt and jacket with blue jeans. I combed my hair sprayed some perfume, and checked my image in the mirror. Looking cool as always. I grinned grabbing my phone and wallet. Going out, Peter? May asked. She was reading a book in the living room. Yep. Going to watch a movie with MJ? I replied wearing my shoes. You have enough money for the snacks? She stood up, keeping her book on the sofa. Yeah, I'm good. Save a bit. Don't worry. I smiled, opening the main door. You close the doors properly and sleep early, okay? Huh? Stop acting like a grown-up. I am the adult here. She laughed. I chuckled, waving her goodbye. I closed the main door, locking it. Then, I rang MJ's bell, waiting for her. It didn't take long before she opened the doors. Damn! She looks beautiful. Her red hair tied in a ponytail. She's wearing a gray jacket, black jeans, and a blue scarf wrapped around her neck. Location. Oscorp Research Facility, third-person POV Norman Osborne paced back and forth in his office. He was frustrated with the recent setbacks in their research. The military contracts were important to keeping Oscorp at the top of the biochemical weapons industry. The funding that those contracts provided would also allow him to move forward with his own personal projects. Projects that had a much more profitable end result than chemical warfare. Among them was the new version of Super Soldier Serum that he was able to recreate from Dr. Erskine's notes, though Norman still needed a way to stabilize it so that it wouldn't kill anyone who used it. The lab rats and spiders he has been testing on haven't shown any promising results except for immense aggression. But he hid this fact about the side effects from the military contractors that funded his work in fear of losing the funding he desperately needed. However, after months of failure after failure, Norman started to lose hope of ever perfecting the serum and moving forward with his plans. Well, things changed when the golden opportunity came walking through his front door one day. An injured teenage mutant with a peculiar ability never before seen walked into the hospital under OS Corp seeking medical help, and Norman saw it as the breakthrough he'd been waiting for. The dormant X genes in that boy's body awakened after the accident. His power is immunity to all diseases and viruses, along with an accelerated healing factor. That was the beginning, at least. Norman knew there was something else dormant inside that boy after he performed various experiments on him. After all, Xavier himself said the X-Genes are capable of unlocking extraordinary abilities in its host. Osborne believed if they could awaken that gene, then it could lead him to finally find the solution he had been looking for all these years. Years passed as he continued to put that boy through inhumane tests to try and activate the dormant gene inside of him. He even went as far as injecting the unstable formula of Super Soldier Serum into that boy's body multiple times in hopes that it might trigger some kind of reaction. But the boy whom they were calling Subject Zero X, his immunity, kept blocking the serum and Norman became infuriated at the lack of progress. He was there that night in that underground facility 
in the observation room, observing the boy through the monitors as usual, while OS Corp scientists conducted another experiment on the boy. Subject 0X was strapped down on the table, surrounded by machines monitoring his vitals. They wanted to extract his immunity X genes, or mutation factor, as OS Corp calls it. Norman wanted to inject the SSS into himself, but to eliminate the side effects, he decided to use Subject 0X's mutation factor. Time was running out for him, and he needed to do something, anything to keep the contractors happy and funding OS Corp. So he instructed the scientists to extract Subject 0X's mutation factor and use it to make an artificial X genes which he could then use to stabilize the SSS. Sir, the kid will die if we proceed with the extraction, one scientist warned Norman, who stood behind the glass wall overlooking the experiment room. That's why you're here, doctor. Do whatever it takes. Osborne coldly said. His father has already been paid handsomely for this, he added. The scientist gulped nervously at his boss' cruel order. Subject 0X weakly opened his eyes and stared at the ceiling. He was lying on that metal table unable to move after being injected with powerful sedatives. The drugs only keep him numb for a few minutes before his immunity power kicks in and neutralizes the drug. But his neck to head were always immune to drugs or any medications. He was always conscious and saw everything they did to him. They had to move fast with the extraction due to the limited time. The boy slowly turned his head to look around the room, filled with machines and scientists wearing white hazmat suits. He was lying on his stomach. So, what's next? Going to inject radiation or nuclear waste inside me? Subject Zero X weakly asked. The scientists ignored him and began preparing the equipment for the extraction. What? No taunts or mocking today. Did I hurt your feelings? He mocked again, but nobody paid attention to him. Suddenly, one scientist approached him and leaned closer to whisper in his ear. You have no idea how sorry I am, she whispered with a hint of regret in her voice. Nah, you have no idea how sorry you all will be if I survive this. Subject Zero X whispered back with a smirk on his face. Then she quickly pulled away and joined the others to prepare for the extraction. They punctured his spinal cord using special needles connected to machines. 33 needles total, all inserted deep into his spine. The boy didn't feel any pain since the sedatives were still at work, but when they pushed the needle deeper into his neck, he felt unimaginable pain that made him scream in agony. Ark, damn you, you mothershmucking bastards. Ark, Subject Zero X screamed at the top of his lungs. Norman watched everything from the observation room, with a sadistic grin on his face. Beginning extraction, a scientist announced. The boy screamed louder as waves of electric current entered his body from the needles and traveled up and down his spine. The machine started beeping. Extraction failed, another scientist announced. Increase the voltage, Norman ordered over the intercoms. The boy continued to scream in agony as more waves of electricity entered his body and traveled up and down his spine. Another failure, sir. The subject won't survive another attempt, the scientist announced. Norman gritted his teeth in anger but quickly calmed his nerves. Extract his spinal fluid then, he ordered. But sir, the scientist tried to protest but Norman cut him off. Just do it. Extract everything, blood, organs, bone marrow, everything, he shouted angrily. The scientist nodded reluctantly and proceeded with the extraction. I will extract it from your remainings. Don't resent me, kid. Think of this as a sacrifice for a noble cause. Norman chuckled darkly to himself as he watched the boy screaming in agony. The boy looked up at the tinted glass window where Norman stood behind. Even though he couldn't see him clearly, he could sense his killer's presence. Subject Zero X glared at the glass wall as tears ran down his cheeks. Norman smirked sinisterly and waved goodbye to the boy who lay helplessly on that metal table being tortured by OS Corp scientists. The boy just smiled at Norman. His eyes glowed red for a flicker second. Got you bastard. He showed him the middle finger. No. Stop the extraction. Keep him alive at all cost. Norman yelled realizing that the boy had awakened his dormant X genes. Sir? The scientist looked confused. He frantically pressed buttons on the console in front of him, trying to shut down the extraction machine. Keep him alive! 
He yelled again. We are sorry, but the subject is already dead, one scientist informed him over the intercom. Norman stopped pressing the buttons and looked up at the screen, showing Subject Zero X lying motionless on that metal table, surrounded by machines monitoring his vital signs. Art, he punched the glass wall in anger, causing cracks to appear everywhere. He panted heavily while staring at the dead boy's body through the cracked glass wall. You, I will extract it from your corpse if I have to. He clenched his fists tightly until blood dripped down his knuckles. Present day, Norman threw the glass of whiskey across the room, shattering it to pieces upon impact against the wall. He sighed loudly before sitting down on the couch in his office. Osborne was furious about the latest news regarding the disappearance of the only serum he was able to create after four years of experimenting on Subject Zero X's remnants. It was supposed to be his big breakthrough. A final product that will eliminate all risks of using the SSS and increase the success rate by over 95%. This was supposed to be a turning point for him and his company, but everything was back to square one. He was standing at the same crossroads he was all those years ago. Norman clenched his fist tightly while glaring angrily at the shattered glass pieces scattered all over the floor. The contractors would want the product soon and Norman needed to deliver otherwise they would pull their funding. Without them, OS Corp won't survive long enough for him to move forward with his other projects. Everything would have been easier if Subject Zero X survived the extraction four years ago. He took out his phone and dialed a number, prepped the machine for human trial. He ordered over the phone. Yes, sir. The person on the other end replied before hanging up. Osborne sighed loudly before picking up the bottle of whiskey and pouring himself another drink. Haunting me years after your death. Aren't you, kid? Insert image of evil face of Norman. Third person POV. Two weeks later, Norman gathered 20 scientists into his office. Most of them worked in OS Corp's bioengineering division. You may wonder why I called you here today. He addressed the group sitting in front of him. Everyone remained silent, listening carefully to him. Well, I have some good news and some bad. Good news is that I forgive you all for the loss of Zero X Serum. Bad news is that you are going to help me fix it, he explained calmly. Everyone exchanged glances, wondering what he meant by that. Osborne took out a folder containing documents and handed each scientist one copy of the document. These documents say that 20 of you are now officially going to become the test subjects for Project SSS, he announced, causing gasps of shock among the scientists. W, what do you mean test subjects, sir? One scientist raised his hand nervously, asking the question everyone was thinking about right now. Since you destroyed something more worth than all of your and this entire company combined, I need replacements, Norman answered coldly, without giving a damn about the consequences of his decision. Be but sir, your formula will kill us if it doesn't work, another scientist protested, but Osborne just ignored him and continued explaining the details of Project SSS. Zol, D, you should have thought about it before losing the serum, right? So... It's only fair for you all to pay for your mistakes by becoming human test subjects for Project SSS, he declared, leaving no room for negotiation. Everyone sat there frozen in place, unable to believe what was happening. Three days should be enough. Norman gave each scientist three days to prepare themselves mentally and physically for the procedure. And if they decide to act smart or try to run away, then he will hunt them down personally and force them to participate in Project SSS whether they like it or not. If that's not sufficient, he will drag their family members into this mess, too, making sure none of them escapes his wrath. Now get the hell out of my office. I don't have time to waste on worthless trash like yourselves, he dismissed the scientists. Everyone immediately stood up and left him alone in his office. Once they left, Osborne poured himself another glass of whiskey before heading downstairs to the lab where Project SSS will take place. It's located in an underground level below the main building. There are several rooms used specifically for conducting experiments on humans, including the observation room, where Norman can observe everything from above via CCTV cameras installed throughout the whole level. As soon as he arrived, OS Corp scientists greeted him and escorted him into the observation room, where Project SSS will commence in three days. How's the preparation going? Norman asked one scientist standing next to him, watching everything through the CCTV screens. 
Almost ready, sir. We just need to finish installing equipment and calibrate them accordingly. The scientist answered nervously while avoiding eye contact with him afraid that he might notice his fear. We are working as fast as we can. Osborne noticed this behavior, but decided not to comment on it knowing how terrified these scientists must be after hearing what happened to Subject Zero X four years ago. Good. Make sure everything goes smoothly this time. He reminded the scientist whose name is Dr. Jace before making his way to another level below ground level one. He entered the elevator and scanned his retina on the scanner. Access granted. Level minus two. The robotic female voice announced before descending deeper underground level 2. Once the doors opened Norman stepped out into an empty hallway, leading directly towards two large steel doors guarded by armed security personnel standing on each side of them. He scanned his retina again on another scanner located beside those steel doors. Access granted. Norman Osborne. The robotic female voice announced again, opening both steel doors, revealing a vast space beyond them containing hundreds of cells, lined up neatly along the walls forming rows stretching further than he could see. Each cell contains a humanoid figure locked inside them, wearing nothing but a plain white shirt and shorts. Some cells contain more than one humanoid figure occupying them. All of these figures were mutants captured by OS Corp during missions conducted across the country searching for subjects suitable for his sick projects. Just in case everything falls apart and Project SSS fails, he will have plenty of backup subjects to continue with his sick experiments. Norman walked past row after row glancing briefly at every cell containing humanoid figures locked inside them. It was like a prison except instead of inmates serving sentences here, Mutants and people with superpowers are imprisoned waiting to be experimented upon. He stopped in front of a particular cell containing two figures occupying it. They're male and female respectively. Both had pale skin covered in scars caused by previous experiments performed on them. He pressed a button next to their cell, activating speakers connected to inside the cell, allowing him to communicate with the figures occupying it. Wanda Maximoff. Pietro Maximoff. Osborne called out their names, causing the figures occupying the cell to turn around, facing him through thick, transparent walls separating them. They stared blankly at him, showing no emotion whatsoever. Their eyes are void of any sign indicating life within them. Norman smiled, seeing how obedient and docile Wanda Maximoff has become over the years since being brought here years ago after killing her parents and burning her hometown down, resulting in massive destruction spreading across Sokovia, destroying thousands of lives. Leaving nothing behind except ruins scattered everywhere across the land, once known as a beautiful peaceful country, full of life, now turned in a graveyard filled only death and despair. Norman used weaponry stolen from Stark Industries, creating chaos and causing mass casualties among innocent civilians living there unaware that their loved ones would never come back alive anymore because someone decided to play God using weapons designed specifically for killing people rather than saving lives. The government blamed Tony Stark claiming that he created weapons capable of committing genocide against innocent people. But Osborne knew better than believing such lies spread by fools ignorant of truth hiding beneath the surface deep underneath layers, covering secrets hidden far away from prying eyes, unable to see clearly enough through the illusion created purposefully to deceive whoever tries uncovering mysteries surrounding certain events occurring randomly without warning, leaving no trace behind proving its existence even existing at all. He captured the remaining survivors of that attack. How are you two doing today? Norman greeted them politely pretending concern towards them, when in reality, he couldn't care less about how they felt or think about anything other than obeying commands given by him, willingly, without hesitation, unlike Subject Zero X who refused to cooperate despite constant torture inflicted upon him. The two teens didn't answer, so Norman continued, I guess it's pretty cold around here, isn't it? Why must you resist? Follow me, and I promise to help you get revenge on Stark. It will not be easy, but you have my word that I will keep both of you alive longer if you behave like obedient children and obey every order given by me. The last time he let them out, they almost destroyed the entire facility, almost killing everyone. Since then, he has kept them within the containment cells specifically designed for them. 
Wanda has yet to manifest her full potential, so she couldn't help but remain in that cell along with her brother waiting obediently for a chance to escape. A blast of red energy slammed on the containment wall, startling him a bit, making him stumble backward a few inches. H-A-A-A. Norman shook his head in disappointment. It's sad. Really sad. Well, enjoy your last months together, because once Project SSS succeeds, I will show you too what happens to those who don't listen to their elders. He gave a final warning before walking away, leaving them alone with nobody else around except themselves, and whatever happens in this prison stays in this prison, hidden beneath layers of secrets buried beneath layers covering everything. After he left, Pietro slammed his fist on the wall, making another dent appear, trying desperately to break free. Wanda watched silently as he kept banging on those walls, cracking them ever so slowly while she stood there feeling powerless, not knowing how to comfort her twin brother, who lost hope long ago. You think we should accept his offer? Wanda finally broke her silence, causing Pietro to stop what he was doing and face her directly staring straight into her eyes without blinking. Why are you saying that? You think we should go with him? You know very well it isn't Stark who was responsible for our parents' deaths, sister. His tone changed abruptly, anger creeping into his voice. She didn't respond immediately afraid of getting angry back because she understands where he gets such feelings coming from. But that doesn't change the fact that it was the Stark weapons that caused our suffering. Her voice trembled slightly when she answered back without looking away from him. We need to survive if we were to have a chance to take our revenge on Stark and Osborne. He is the one who captured us, so it is only right that he suffers along with his creations. She added sharply, making her point crystal clear to him. Her brother seems hesitant to follow up with what she suggested. Unsure how far will they succeed once released from this prison, where both of them are imprisoned like caged animals. But he realizes they really have no choice but to do what Osborne commands. So he reluctantly agrees to work under Osborne's command. All right, I'm in. And that concludes this episode. If you enjoyed it, I'd seriously love it if you guys could leave a like on the video as it genuinely helps out so much. And it keeps me going. Plus, it takes only one second. That said, have a wonderful day. See you in the next one.